Hey there, beloved saints, and welcome to Thursday's Theological Throwdown. Uh, I am so excited to have the guest we have tonight. And I wanted to discuss this for a while, but I want to be real clear what my motivation is here. You guys know last year, every Thursday, we would have a discussion. We would either have a guest, like we had Gary Wayne last week. Uh, that specializes in a specific area, or we would have a panelist that would just get together and discuss topics. And so regardless of where you stand on this topic, I would ask that everyone be kind to one another. I do not believe this has to be a divisive issue. Um, I don't know anyone I agree with 100% on all things. We are all in different areas of growth in our study, and more is revealed to me all the time. So um, with that being said, I also want to let you know that it is not my intention to try to convert anyone to agree with uh, my personal position of conditional immortality uh, and Conditional immortality is what we're going to discuss tonight, which is the belief that scripture supports that only those in Christ are immortal. Only those in Christ have eternal life. The lost do not. They are not immortal. They ultimately die, cease to exist. And we want to discuss the only argument we're having tonight on this issue is that the Bible supports it. So I don't I don't have any intention of making this a philosophical argument or to bring up God's nature or how eternal conscious torment doesn't agree with God's nature. None of that. This is only what the Bible says, taking a look at what the Bible says, taking a look at some of the verses used um, in the past to support eternal conscious torment, where this doctrine came from, how it became uh, orthodox or the more, more popular position. And so with that being said, tonight's guest is, um, I guess, is, is it okay to call you Brother Chris? If, if, uh, if you consider me a brother in Christ, yeah. Yes, absolutely. So uh, Brother Chris Date. Uh, he has a channel and a website called Rethinking Hell, and it is a scriptural study on this doctrine. And so that's why I've asked him uh, to come here tonight, because he has done an amazing, thorough job of explaining this position and why. Chris, thank you so much for coming out to talk to us tonight. Uh, thank you for inviting me. The honor is all mine. And just so you guys, I don't know if it's up there. I think it is his website and his YouTube channel. There should be links for you to access those either on the screen and or in the description area. I'll make sure both of those are on there. And Ben has uh, put the graphics up, so it should be available to you guys if you want to um, look into Chris's work further. So, um, you know, I wanted to tell you, Chris, I I came to this conclusion a couple of years ago when I decided I was I, I was sick of listening to people in regards because there were so many different preachings. And so I decided I was going to take topic by topic and just study the word for years myself. And so but it wasn't just me in my own head. I I would go to two mature or more people in Christ I knew and, and run it past them. But this came about on the basis of two verses. The one verse that got me to look into it um, uh, was twice dead, plucked up by the roots. And the other one was Sodom and Gomorrah, you know, uh, being destroyed by eternal fire. And mm -hmm. so twice dead, plucked up by the roots, it made me think of a flower. No, you can kill a flower, you can cut it by the stem, but if the roots in the ground, it's not gone. It's just not blooming right now. And I kind of saw that as like the first death, the physical death. But Jesus said to fear the one who can destroy 
both body and soul in Gehenna. So I was like, the twice dead plucked up by the roots is like, there's nothing left of them. So that mm -hmm. must be the difference between physical death and, you know, full on death, you know, because Jesus promised you shall not surely die. That was the promise, you know, that he tasted death for every man. So that is what got me digging. And I found to my surprise that in the Old Testament and the New, I, I could find very little to support eternal conscious torment. Could you tell us a little bit about how you came to understand conditional immortality? Yeah, sure. And if it's okay with you, um, I'll give the background of that, which is my conversion. Um, oh. I was an atheist as far back as I can remember up until um, around the age of 20 or 21, shortly after, I think it was, the birth of my wife's and my first son. My wife and I got married as atheists. Um, and throughout my upbringing, I was not exposed to uh, Christian theology. I didn't know what Christians believe about this or that topic. But when I finally became a Christian, which is a whole other story, there were two things that I had at the very least picked up about Christianity from the surrounding culture. One of them is that I should believe the Bible. So when I became a Christian, I was like, okay, well, that better be where I go to to formulate my beliefs. And then one other thing I remember already knowing when I became a Christian is that as a Christian, I better believe that the lost are going to suffer forever in hell. Um, it's it's just it's all over the culture inside and outside of the church. It's it's just the default position. It's ubiquitous, uh, ubiquitous, and. Um, very soon after I became a believer, I was challenged by um, people from pseudo-Christian cults. And in the course of that, I learned how to defend uh, the doctrine of eternal torment from Scripture um, and did so for several years. Uh, the first 10 years of my faith, roughly, from 2000 uh, to 2010, roughly, uh, I was a believer in the doctrine of eternal torment, and I defended it. Um, I was committed and remain committed to the inerrancy and authority of Scripture, um, and I am reformed, which is a whole other topic, but one of the things that I think is part and parcel of what it means to be reformed is that you trust that God is good, whatever it is that he reveals he will do in scripture. And so if he reveals in scripture that he's going to cause the wicked to suffer forever in hell, I was fine with that. That's God. He's just and holy and I'm not. And I was okay with that. But Around, like I said, roughly around 2010, I um, was talking to a Christian friend of mine who um, who, uh, who I discovered held to this view, and I, the, the view that we're going to be discussing today, conditional immortality, annihilationism. And I challenged him from um, a, a text in Mark 9, verse 48 where Jesus says in Gehenna, their worm will not die and the fire will not be quenched. And I said, look, and I, I mentioned his name. I said, look, this, this text seems to indicate that the worm will not die and the fire will not be quenched. Isn't that everlasting hell? And he said, well, before we get into that in depth, why don't you look at the text that Jesus is quoting? And I was like, what? <laughs> what are you talking about? And, and sure enough, Jesus is quoting an Old Testament text. He's not coming up with it on his own. And the text he's quoting is Isaiah 66, 24, in which Isaiah says the dead bodies of this people will be um, uh, eaten up by fire and maggots. The, the, the worm that will not die refers to the decomposition of these corpses. Uh, it, it, it's it's um, that their, their, their decomposition will not stop. And the fire that will not be quenched, I discovered, is language throughout the Bible to refer to the fact that God's fiery wrath can't be stopped, can't be put out. And what happens when you fail to put out a fire? It burns stuff up. And so when, when, I, when I encountered this, I was like, wow, maybe I have indeed gotten this wrong. And so I began an investigation process. I interviewed the one of the most foremost conditionalists in modern history named Edward Fudge, who passed away a few years ago. I interviewed him on my show. And uh, as a result of preparing for and conducting that interview, I found myself squarely on the fence between these two views, unsure of which was true. And over the next, say, six, seven or eight months, I finally became fully convinced of conditional immortality and and the rest is is as they say history yeah so you were like me you 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 were introduced to christianity and you just 
knew the Bible is the word of God. So whatever it said, that's what, that's what God was just. God was holy. God was good. And as human beings, we really don't have a, a, a way to judge that. His ways are higher than our ways. And I, I'm, I'm with you on that. Uh, I would have accepted whatever. I, I, I have no place to judge God since I don't know everything. So if, if that's what I thought the Bible said, I would, I would say, okay, that's what I believe. Um, but, you know, once I, I realized I, I literally took uh, and put during my study, I took a plethora of verses, every verse I could find on what would happen to the destruction of the wicked, what would happen to the lost, you know, uh, and I had this huge list of destruction, you know, destruction, uh, um, uh, that they'd be broken into pieces that, you know, their worm dieth not, which I, I never thought it was what some people do. I've heard people claim to take trips to an unbiblical hell. It has more to do with Dante's Inferno than what I see in scripture, but, uh, where they say worms are crawling in and out of people for all eternity and tormenting them. And. And I thought, well, that's bizarre because I, I did know of the, I saw the Isaiah verse and I did know it was referring to corpses. And I thought the worm died not, not just meant, well, the worm doesn't die because the body never rises to glory. You know, it just keeps on eating. And I figured it was symbolism. But I, then I saw the verses that support it were, it was literally maybe three or four. And most of them were references to Old Testament symbology. And so um, that's ultimately what got me over here, um, mm-hmm. you know, to to the side of believing that. But it took a really long time. And I I want to say uh, the I, I would say the popular orthodox position is usually I, I'm real slow to leave that position because it means it's been debated and studied for many years by many wonderful people of God. So I'm very slow to come away from that. And I think that's helped me. Uh, yeah, yeah. I I try, uh, I try not to get swept away too easily. You know, um, <laughs> early on in my zeal for God, I would I wanted to please Him so much, I would fall into all kinds of, you know, different things. But um, the thing is, I see happening is that the big problem I see is that this has to make a presupposition. That death doesn't mean death, perish doesn't mean perish, and that man is ultimately immortal. So where where did that come from, if it's not in Scripture? Or is it in Scripture? Well, no, it's not in Scripture, um, but let's make sure that we are precise when we talk about immortality, because very often um, in the context of this debate, people talk about the immortality of the soul, and that's not something that I'm necessarily here to dispute, but what, um, but, but they don't often acknowledge that when we talk about hell, in, in, in the traditional view, the, the popular dominant view through history, we're also talking about the immortality of the resurrected body. So let me back up a second, and um, just for listeners that aren't aware, let me flesh out just what the doctrine of eternal torment is, because it's very easy to, to just think in terms of everlasting pain as that as if that's all the doctrine entails, but it's not. Um, all Christians since the beginning of Christian history have believed that one day all the dead, both saved and lost, will have risen from their graves. And I say... I speak. I say it in that way to accommodate premillennialism because they hold to a two-stage resurrection. You know, the saints resurrecting from the dead at the beginning of the thousand years, and the rest of the world at the end of the thousand years. Those of us who are amillennialists and postmillennialists would say it's all at once. But either way, the point is there will come a point in time in which all humanity has risen from the dead bodily, like their bodies, their physical bodies come back to life and are reunited with their immaterial souls, and. All Christians since the beginning of Christian history have believed that when that happens, the resurrected bodies of the saved will be made immortal and will literally live forever in the new heavens and new earth, a a glorified, restored physical cosmos. 
Um, so as as much as I can touch my hand right now, that'll be what it's what it's like in eternity as well. Uh, it's just that my body will no longer be frail and subject to pain, disease, and aging. It'll be glorified and perfect. Now, this is where though the different views of hell diverge, where they where they disagree with one another, because according to the traditional view and universalism, by the way. What I just said about the, the resurrected bodies of the saved being made immortal will also be true of the wicked, of the lost. When they are raised from the dead, according to both eternal torment and universalism, their bodies will be made immortal as well. So if you look through the quotes from um, believers in this view ever since about 180 AD, roughly, those, that's the first time any Christians talk about eternal torment, ever since then, uh, defenders of this view have said that the, resurrect, the resurrected wicked will be immortal in body and soul, and they will literally, physically live forever, albeit in hell. In fact, it's not all that uncommon um, for you to hear statements like, everybody gets eternal life, the question is, where will you live it, right, in, in, in the new heavens, new earth, or in hell? So that's, that's really important. This debate is not ultimately about the cessation of existence. It's not ultimately about uh, ongoing pain. The debate is about life and about immortality. And the traditional view and universalism both affirm a what you might call unconditional, uh, unconditional immortality. God gives immortality up to all resurrected humankind indiscriminately. There aren't any conditions anybody has to be has to have to meet in order to be made uh, immortal. It's just he does it to everybody. By contrast. We conditionalists and annihilationists believe that resurrected immortality will only be granted to the resurrected saved. When the lost are raised from the dead, they will be raised still mortal, and they will literally die a second time, but their souls will die too, uh, as we learn in Matthew 10, 28, and so they will cease to exist. But the point is, what they are losing out on is life itself, because they're not made immortal and thereby capable of living forever. Now, with that I know I, that was long-winded, and I'm sorry, but I just want to make that clear to people that are watching that aren't already familiar with the terrain of the debate. So now going to your question, what does the Bible say about immortality? Well, in the very, very first book of the Bible, in fact, the very third chapter of the very first book of the whole Bible, Genesis 3, we're explicitly told that by kicking Adam and Eve after they sinned out of the garden— and thereby preventing them from continuing to eat from the tree of life, God guaranteed they would eventually die. It's it's explicit. The, the text says, the narrator says, or the narrator quotes God as saying, lest they reach out and uh, their hand and take from the tree of life and eat and live forever. And then the narrator comes in and says, thus God kicked Adam and Eve out of the garden. Um, and that's what secured their eventual demise. So without access to the tree of life, human beings are mortal and will eventually physically perish. Now, what's praise God, what's, what's, what's praiseworthy is the fact that the Bible doesn't say that's the end of the story. The Bible says the tree of life will reappear. At the other end of Scripture is where it talks about in the second to last chapter of the book of Revelation, Revelation chapter 21. The tree of life there reappears and only the saved have access to its fruit, thereby indicating that only the saved will have access to everlasting ongoing life. So we can see that this, this view of immortality as being something that God's only going to grant the saved is literally span, spanning, the cover, spanning the pages of Scripture from cover to cover. It's at the very beginning, and it's at the very end. But it's not only in those two places. It's, it's scattered in various other places as well. So Isaiah 25 and 26, for example, um, Yahweh says he's going to swallow up death forever, and um, and in the very next chapter, that, that was Isaiah 25 where he says that, but in the context of that, the next chapter, Isaiah 26, um, says the that God's people um, will rise and live, but it says the wicked will not. So there you've got immortality and enduring life promised to the saved in that God will swallow up death forever, but he's only going to, he, but that swallowing up of death only secures the everlasting life of the saved, not the wicked. We also see in 1 Corinthians 15 what, what is very often called Paul's resurrection magnum opus. He talks about the resurrection body of the saved. His, the whole context of 1 Corinthians 15 is about the saved. And at the end of it, he says, this perishable mortal body must put on immortality to be made fit to inherit the kingdom of God. So immortality is something that makes a person fit to inherit the kingdom of God 
but that's obviously not something that's going to happen to the lost. Moreover, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, that the last enemy to be destroyed will be death. But if death is destroyed when the resurrection happens and people are made immortal, but then enemies of God continue to exist forever, then death isn't the last enemy to be destroyed. Other enemies continue to suffer and gnash their teeth in anger and weep in pain and be internally rebellious toward God, etc. Um, continue forever. So there, there is no final enemy to be destroyed. There continue to be enemies of God that exist throughout all eternity. So that doesn't work. We also see this in Luke 20, verses 35 and 36. The, the Sadducees are challenge, challenging Jesus about uh, immortality in the, ever, in the uh, resurrection state. And Jesus says to them that those who are deemed worthy to attain to the resurrection and to the age to come won't be able to die anymore. Well, what's the natural implication there? That those not deemed worthy will be able to die anymore. And it goes on and on from there. John 3, 16, God so loved the world uh, that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him would not be made immortal and live forever in pain and hell. Wait, sorry, I misquoted that. No, he, he God so loved the world that he gave his beloved son that, only, that whosoever believes in him would not perish. And if there were any doubt about what perish means there, it's in it's it's a Greek verb which in the middle voice, like it's being used here, means to die. And secondly, in the immediately preceding verse, John 3, 14 and 15, Jesus compares himself to the statue of a serpent that Moses held up in the um, desert. Um, that if you recall that pass that that text from Numbers, I think it is, um, the people that would be the Israelites if they'd been bitten by fatally venomous snakes, they were sure to die from that snake bite. But if they would look at the statue of the serpent that that Moses held up, they would literally have their lives saved. Well, so Jesus is saying that's what I do. The gospel and Jesus is not a matter of real estate. It's not a matter of where you're going to go to live, either the good place or the bad place. It's not a matter of real estate. It's a matter of life and death. So I know that was a very long winded to your answer, but that's hopefully gets the ball rolling for a fruitful discussion. No, no, that that's exactly uh, the point I wanted to make. And what came up for me was here's, here's the argument I get. I, I say the same thing. Once I understood that our choice was life or death, everything made sense. The atonement on the cross, uh, what, uh, God's mercy and justice, everything fell into place. And then this plethora of verses I saw about their, their end is destruction. They're destroyed. They perish. Uh, they're twice dead, plucked up by the roots, destroyed both body and soul in Gehenna. I, I'll tell you, I, the, the, the argument I get is, yeah, but Adam and Eve only died physically there. Their soul lives on for all eternity. Now, where'd that come from? Is that in the well, Bible? Well, before I answer that question, let me just point out that that's a bit of a red herring from defenders of the traditional view, because as we've already discussed, hell isn't a place where disembodied souls go in the traditional view, right? It's a place where resurrected immortals go. So let's not throw the red herring, oh, they only physically died, they didn't spiritually die. Yeah, but you don't think the wicked will physically die, ever. So that's a red herring. Now, to your to your question, does the Bible ever talk about an immaterial soul living forever? No, simply it does not. What it might do is indicate that humans have immaterial souls that can exist consciously between death and resurrection. I say might because not all Christians agree on that. There are a minority of us Christians who actually think that we humans are physical creatures and that when we die, we cease to be conscious of anything and our only hope of ongoing life is resurrection. Right. But of course, most Christians ever since the very beginning have believed in um, mind body dualism, that, that we do have immaterial souls and that soul will continue to exist between death and resurrection. But the Bible never, ever indicates, impl implies, uh, you know, anything like that, that disembodied souls or resurrected humans will exist uh, forever. There's just nothing there at all. Now, one of the things that you said. And I think, and I believe Edward Fudge did too. I actually went back and listened to say he's, he seemed like a wonderful man. Uh, he was. So, I, I, a dear friend. I miss him a lot. I, I said I was not able to meet him. Just really amazing. Uh, just an energy about him was really great. Um, one of the things uh, I noticed 
is many people were not aware that or maybe they have like the concept of it but don't realize how much the book of revelation and the apostles and jesus himself used idioms metaphors similes popular terms of phrase from the old testament and so the jews would have understood exactly what he was talking about when he said weeping and gnashing of teeth or the worm dieth not they would have gone right to isaiah or they you know the psalms or it, they would have gotten it whereas gentiles who maybe do, don't have an understanding of uh the symbology would give another maybe private interpretation or more literal interpretation and so uh uh, one of the other things that I hear, see this, a weight was lifted off me because everything makes sense now. I'm not confused <laughs> if it says death or die or perish, destroyed, uh, everlasting punishment. It means permanent forever. It doesn't mean the punishment is endured for all eternity. The punishment is permanent. So things seem to make more sense to me. Like I, I get it. Um, Whereas when we're not having clear lines or we're trying to say death isn't really death, uh, perishing isn't really perishing, or that the perishing is an ongoing thing that goes on for a million years and you're still there. Always dying and never being dead. Never, <laughs> always dying and torment. Never. Yeah. So like, uh, you know, obviously there's philosophical arguments for it. You know, if Christ tasted death for every man. If eternal conscious torment is the debt, the wages of sin is death. That's what the wages of sin are, death. But if death isn't really death, what's the wage and how is it paid? And I've heard I've heard some arguments to support eternal conscious torment on that as well. But this everything just falls into place. So what I'm asking you here is the story of Lazarus and the rich man is often used to promote eternal conscious torment and it's too much to explain to someone in a text or to write so it's it's very difficult to explain so i'm putting you on the spot uh lazarus and the rich man i think is where we're going to start on that but i i had a Great. couple others yeah so would you like me to speak to that or did you have a yes, more would. does that support what it, what is being said there is that right well, well, so I'd rather, instead of saying what is being said, I'd rather say what isn't being said. And let me explain what I mean by that. Even if one takes Luke 16 and the story of Lazarus and the rich man there as if it's a historical narrative, um, and, and I say that because that thought that it's a historical narrative sounds absolutely absurd to, I think, most Christians, and rightfully so. But there are indeed some Christians who take the position that what's going on here is that Christ is recounting a historical narrative. And I want to say, fine, let's embrace it as a historical narrative, but let's see what it is and is not saying. And there are at least three things in the text that indicate that what it's not saying is anything at all about hell. Firstly, it's not talking, it explicitly uses the word Hades. Now, there's a King James onlyist in the chat, I believe, going by the name Glad Tidings, who's saying that that's actually a good translation, that hell is a great is a great word to translate Hades there. And that's fine, um, because that's only one element of the in, of the um, of the narrative that indicates that it's in the intermediate state rather than in hell. Uh, for those who aren't familiar, the phrase intermediate, intermediate state is what we um, blowhard theologians refer to, the, it is used to refer to the time between death and resurrection. And it's called intermediate for, for precisely the reason that it comes to an end at resurrection. Um, so the reason that we know, the first reason we know this is actually the scene is taking place in the intermediate state, not the resurrected eternity, is because the word Hades is, is explicitly used to, to, to refer to the location in which the scene is set. But if you, but if somebody like Glad Tidings wants to ignore that, that's fine. There are at least two other um, uh, reasons that we know this is not about hell. Firstly, the text explicitly says that the rich man and Lazarus have been have been buried. I'm gonna back right? up there. You said is not about hell. Can you just say there's two different words translated hell? That, uh, can you explain? <laughs> 
Okay. Yeah, I will. Um, but let me let me preface this by saying that the reason I didn't go there is because I wasn't sure how much of your audience are King James onlyists. Oh, you got it. Um, so uh, for those of you who aren't King James onlyists and who care what the original text was, I'm sorry, I'm being a little flippant and I apologize. I don't mean to insult. But for those of you who care about what the original languages were that the actual authors of Scripture used, um, Matt, Jesus predominantly uses the word ge Gehenna is the Greek word, and we transliterate it Gehenna. Um, this is a shortening, a, 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 an abbreviated transliteration of the Hebrew Old Testament uh, phrase, the Valley of the Sons of Hinnom. In fact, you can even kind of hear it there if you're careful. Gehenna, that Enna part is coming from Hinnom, right? Um, uh, and and Gay, the prefix there it means like a, a land, you know, the land of Hinnom. And um, in the Old Testament, if you look at texts like Jeremiah seven, for example, um, the old the Valley of the Son of Hinnom was a place where idol worshippers, you know, people who worshipped Molech and Baal, they they sacrificed their children. To in, by fire in this valley, for which reason God promised that it would one day become uh, a scene of, of, of punishment. Um, and in Jeremiah 7, God says uh, that God's enemies will be, his, his enemies will be slain and their dead bodies will be foods for the birds and, uh, and the beasts of the earth, and nobody will frighten them away. Um, this is a picture of people desperately trying to shoo birds and beasts away from the carcasses of their loved ones, because to have your corpse consumed by fire or maggots in that time was considered a deep shame. And so they would try to frighten away the beasts and the birds so that their, their corp until their corpses could be buried. And God is saying here, no, that won't even, that can't even save you. You're going to die. The, the wicked are going to die and your bodies are going to deteriorate away or be eaten up. And there's nothing you can do about it. And that picture of the Valley of the Son of Hinnom as a picture of God's death dealing wrath, wrath, which kills his enemies, becomes a picture that Jesus is evoking when he uses the word Gehenna. He's trying to, he's telling his listeners, you know, that Valley of the Son of Hinnom that you read about in the Old Testament? That's what I'm talking about, that picture of hell. All right. So this is what Jesus is talking about with hell is, is Gehenna. Um, and in the book of Revelation, it appears to be what is referred to by the symbol that is the lake of fire into which the devil, the beast, and the false prophet are thrown and eternally tormented. And, and I'm sure we'll get to that at some point in this conversation. So when we talk about hell, the place of final punishment, we're talking about Gehenna that Jesus uses and the lake of fire in the book of Revelation. But the King James Version, for all of its many benefits, um, did a real disservice to the church um, because it translated other words, hell, as well, that don't have anything to do with hell. One of those words is the Greek noun Hades, which we pronounce Hades in, in the English. Um, this is the New Testament Greek equivalent of the Old Testament Hebrew Sheol. Sheol um, and Hades don't refer to hell. They refer to the place of the dead, the underworld. Um, whether you think it's some place where disembodied souls or spirits go and remain conscious until resurrection is, is irrelevant. The point is, it's where the dead are. It's not where the living are. So, so, and that's why, for example, Peter says in um, Acts, uh, what is it, two or three or four, that he quotes the Old Testament psalm and says that Jesus was not abandoned to Hades. He he was not allowed to he was not allowed to see corruption, meaning his body didn't decompose. So Jesus didn't go to hell. Obviously, if you think Jesus went to hell, you're a heretic. Um, it's called the Word of Faith movement, and it goes by some other names. Jesus didn't go to hell, and yet Peter says he wasn't abandoned there, meaning he did go there, but came back up. Hades, that is. What he means is he went to the place of the dead. All right. Um, so that's Hades. It's the place of the dead. And then similarly, um, there's one other word and the word is Tartarus, but that's a bit of a miss. It's a little bit misleading because in Greek mythology, Tartarus is the place where semi-divine beings would go to be punished. They were sort of the Greek equivalent of angels in um, in Hebraic Christianity and Judeo-Christianity. And what Peter does is he uses a verb form of that. Um, instead of Tartarus, he uses the verb Tartarao, which essentially means to cause to go into Tartarus. But he says that of the angels, not humans. He never says humans went uh, or go to Tartarus. He says the angels, fallen angels did. 
So he's trading upon the Greek mythological Tartarus, um, and he's saying that a fallen angels God sends to something like Tartarus. So those are the four words, and if there are others you want to ask about that I'm not thinking of, you can. But Gehenna and the Lake of Fire is hell. Hades and Tartarus have to do with the time between death and resurrection. Is that? Is yeah. That is it, aren't they just basically the grave or the dwelling of the dead? Hades and Hades. Well, that depends on whom you ask. I say yes, but most Christians who believe that humans have immaterial souls that exist consciously between death and resurrection, they wouldn't want to say that Sheol is merely the grave. They would want to say it's the underworld. It's it's where the dead continue to exist consciously. And I'm just I'm just giving latitude for that belief is all. Either way, it's about the time between death right. and resurrection. But that is not a permanent place. Regardless. Quite, quite the opposite. Yeah. The, the book of Revelation in Revelation 20 depicts Hades being emptied um, by a resurrection. And then Hades is thrown into the lake of fire. And then just a few verses later, we're told what that symbolism means when God says in Revelation 24, I think it is, or 28, death shall be no more. Hades being emptied and then thrown into the lake of fire is a symbol for the annihilation of death and Hades. <laughs> so yes, Hades is a temporary thing. It's not at all an eternal everlasting thing. Now, I, I just saw someone post something in the Revelation. I'm just organically kind of like okay. what I see. Just don't, just don't forget to come back to Luke 16 so I can finish that thought. But. Um, saying that I just want to make a point that some of these things in Revelation are very symbolic. And it just remind me if I forget to that later on I would like to discuss the symbolism and how it should not be taken literally. It should be something that was seen in the spirit to identify something that's happening or will happen. So uh, I wanted to, I didn't mean to take you off course there, that's but right. I think it's important to define what the King James Version says is hell. And I agree with you, I'm a Ken, King James first, but I happen to know, I'm not a only, um, I happen to know that um that particular putting that english word on so many greek and hebrew words confuses people and they get a mental image of something that i don't think is fully scriptural like what when when someone says uh we're talking about hell as in hades or sheol i always think the place of the dead yeah um, and when it says gehenna i think of the final place the lake of fire that is yeah the ultimate destination. Um, so whether, and I, I'll leave this open. I, I do believe in an intermediary. You know, I believe that, that we're, cause I, Moses and Elijah met with Jesus, you know, um, mm -hmm. I'm familiar. Yeah. So I, I, of course you do. Um, <laughs> but I mean, that's one of the positions, you know, I believe absent from the body. We, we are with the Lord. Yeah. Our first Samuel 28, the, you know, and the, the medium at Endor brings up Samuel right. for Saul. I mean, there, there are these texts that challenge those of us who don't think humans are conscious between death and resurrection. That's for sure. But I don't think it, it, it's not an issue per se, because again, mm -hmm. that's intermediary. Yeah. Uh, and ultimately we see what happens to the lost and they end up in Gehenna, which is also translated hell. So I wanted to let the viewers realize that when it says hell, it can either mean the intermediary place, the temporary place, or the permanent lake of fire destination. And so right. uh, I want to uh, just be clear that when we have this discussion, that when I asked you about Lazarus and the rich man is what I asked uh, brother Chris about. And we kind of went off track, but we had to because I, I really want people to understand this. This is a me intermediary. This is Hades, right? That Lazarus and the Rich Man is happening in. Yes, and and even if somebody like Glad Tidings in the chat, who is a King James onlyist, um, wants to say I trust the translation hell more than I do the fact that the underlying Greek is Hades, that's fine because we still have at least two reasons that tell us that the hell the King James Version is talking about there is the intermediate state, not the final state. Those two reasons are the following. First, the Bible explicitly says that Lazarus and the rich man have been buried. 
All right. So this is a place where they've gone to after they died. It's not a place where they've gone to after they've been raised, resurrected. But here's but even more than that, here is the silver bullet. There simply is no way around the following. The text, the text says that the rich man pleads with Abraham, asking him to let Lazarus go and warn his still living brothers not to come there. Now think about this for a minute. Hell is supposed to be a place where after resurrection, all the lost are thrown into it. There are no blissfully unaware people at that point. Nobody's blissfully unaware of their impending doom going about life as usual when we're talking about the final punishment. So this has to be talking. There's simply no way around it. Even if you trust the translation in hell, it's still talking about the intermediate state. So even if you take this as a historical narrative, and even if you capitalize certain words like Glad Tidings is doing in the chat, as if that proves his point, the most it proves is that there's conscious torment that people undergo between death and resurrection. And that's it. But again, the book of Revelation says that one day that intermediate experience will come to an end when all of the dead who are in Hades come, out, come up out of it in resurrection. So now I could say a whole lot more about Luke 16 and this story. There's a, I don't think it's a historical narrative. I don't even think it's realistic. But that's neither here nor there because the point is that it's not about hell at all. And that's what I had to say about that. <laughs> Well, I, I won't spend too long on it. I, I do okay. believe it's a parable because I so, it's in no, between six other parables. I, well, I it think. starts out in exactly the same way. He had just got done earlier in that same chapter talking about a parable that starts out with there was a certain man. And that's ex identically the Greek that is used to begin this story as well. <laughs> so Right. And I, I think the whole point was to show uh, people that thought if you were wealthy that God must be with you, that that uh, isn't actually always the case. Exactly. I like a whole separate point being made there. It wasn't to say there's eternal conscious torment forever, but that wasn't the point at all. Uh, and nor do I think it actually says that. I think it's important. Um, what you said, we, we have to look at what something says and what something does not say. Um, right. sometimes we put our preconceived ideas into the scriptures and i you know i'm guilty of that too i have to always make sure i'm seeing what's there and not what i think is there um and i i want to talk mostly about some of these verses the gentleman in the chat was saying you know i believe that those that take the mark of the beast the devil and the fallen angels the antichrist and the false prophet they they have eternal conscious torment, but I don't know about everyone else. And I think that uh, maybe based on two verses, maybe they shall have no rest day or night, which take the beast. I, I thought that was here on earth when they cry for death and death won't come. I'm not sure. I can't say. Maybe I'll tell. That is. Me. That's not about hell. That's prior to hell. OK, that's here, right? On earth during this time where they can't die. Or the, part, the part where it says they wish to die, but can't. Yeah. Okay. By the way, that by the way, that that person in the chat is accusing me of of cowardice. Just wanted to <laughs> point that oh, out. No, guys, I, I asked you, please let let's just at least hear each other out. We're not asking you to agree with us or even come to our way of thinking, but just understand there is a a lot of thought and study in this position, and it is based on God's word. It's not it's not something we want to be true. I believe it actually is what scripture says. And I'm only doing this because I've been called every name in the book for, right. for believing this. And I didn't even speak about it for a couple of years because I was called so many names, but I was kind of forced to come out and you know, say my position because I, I was being assaulted so badly. And I think that this should not cause division. You're my brother and sister in Christ. If you believe in eternal conscious torment, I love you. I, I have no problem with that. I think it's important that we not be so dogmatic that we can't even hear why someone believes something they do. You yeah. know, we're not here to insult you if you believe it differently, uh, but yeah. just so that you can understand the position a little better. Yeah, I totally agree with you. And just in my own defense, in answer to um, Glad Tidings' uh, accusation there, I can only answer the questions that Renee asks me. So it's not like I, I, I can't I can't respond to multiple people in the chat while also answering Renee's questions. So I mean, come on, let's let's be sensible here. Anyway, go yeah. ahead. 
if if we have time, I I will see if if Chris can answer some questions. I'd love to very much. Yeah. So let's uh at the end, I'll ask everybody to put their questions in all caps, and then we'll get to that. I promise. That way, because right now he can't. I can't even pay attention to the chat. <laughs> so I'm, I want to listen so that I can ask the appropriate questions. Um, so uh, that assumption comes from probably the wording, the way it's worded in the book of Revelation, you know, where it says the beast and the false prophet are. Do you want me to pull those verses up? You don't have to. I mean, I, I know them fairly well. OK, yeah, those I think that's what he's basing that on. So what what do you say about a verse like that? Could you explain those verses? I, I very much want to, but before I do, I want to establish something about the, the genre of the book of Revelation, just what it is that it's recording. Because for a long time as a Christian, I had the same assumption that I think probably many of the people even watching this right now have, which is that what John is seeing is the future, as if somebody had filmed the future on a camera and then sent the recording in, back in time to him, and then he popped it in a Blu-ray player and watched it or something like that. But that's right. not that's not how this kind of vision works. And as proof, just go look at Joseph in prison. Go look at Joseph interpreting Pharaoh's uh, visions. Look at Daniel interpreting Nebuchadnezzar's visions, angels interpreting Daniel's visions, and an angel even interpreting John's own vision here in the book of Revelation. What becomes clear when you look at all these instances is that the future is in fact being foretold, but the way that the future is being foretold to the prophet is by means of sometimes very perplexing perplexing symbolism. In fact, it's so perplexing that in all the examples I've just given, a divine interpreter, somebody who has access to the truth of the meaning, has to interpret it for the prophet or for the prophet's hearers. So when we read, for example, uh, the devil, the beast, and the false prophet are thrown into the lake of fire and tormented forever and ever, um, it's... we. we angelic beings or humans, but that's not the case. The beast is not a single human being. It's a seven-headed, ten-horned, monstrous beast upon which a harlot named Mystery Babylon is riding. It's 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 vivid, bizarre it's symbolism, and that doesn't mean that we can um, dismiss it, and I by no means intend to do that, but it does mean that we have to interpret with extreme care because we are 2,000 years removed from the culture that's, that from which this imagery sprang, and we're culturally, culturally far removed as well. I'm not Jewish, uh, and if there are Jews watching right now, they're not first century Jews. Mm -hmm. So so there's, so we have to be very careful when we interpret the book of Revelation, and that's all I'm appealing to your listeners for. Now, with that in mind, let's tackle the first of the two big Revelation texts first, all right? Revelation chapter 14, 9 to 11. Now, what's important about this pericope, about these few verses, is that there are at least three symbols in the pericope. Um, there's drinking of God's wrath, all right, because the text says they'll drink the wine of God's wrath mixed full strength, you know, from the cup of his anger. Excuse me. There's um, uh, uh, fiery and sulfuric torment, and there's um, smoke rising forever and ever. And I agree that what seems to be being depicted in the imagery is everlasting torment. All right. So I'm the first person to say that what the book of Revelation depicts portrays in the vision is indeed everlasting torment. The question, however, is what does this symbolism mean? What does it, what does the picture of people being tormented forever and ever mean in reality? And we don't have to come up with this on our own. We can just look at the text itself just a few chapters later, because in Revelation chapters 18 and 19, all three of those symbols reappear. Um, Revelation 18 describes this blood drunk vampiric prostitute with the name Mystery Babylon written on her forehead, and she's 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 riding the, that seven headed, ten horned beast I mentioned. And the text says that she is made to drink of God's wrath, uh, or at least it implies it. it it's it, it, God tells His people to force her to drink double what she meted out. Um, it describes her fiery torment. And then at the beginning of Revelation 19, a, hallelu a hallelujah chorus cries out, um, her, sm her smoke rises forever and ever. The identical phraseology. Mm 
So you've got all the same symbols used in Revelation 14, 9 to 11, used again of this mystery Babylon in Revelation 18 and 19. But here's the kicker. Here's the critical detail. Toward the end of Revelation 18, an angel interprets this imagery for John and tells him that it symbolizes the destruction of the city that the woman represents. So in this picture, you've got this blood-drunk vampiric prostitute being tormented in fire and drinking God's wrath, and smoke rises from her torment forever. But the angel says that symbolizes the destruction of the city she represents. So I don't have to do any guesswork to figure out what the symbolism means. I don't have to treat the eternal torment in the imagery as if it's also eternal torment in reality. I can just go by the way the symbolism is used later in the very same vision and demonstrate, look, it all communicates destruction. Now, I'll just add one more thing, which is that some of these symbols are, as you've already intimated a few times, coming straight from the Old Testament. Um, most clearly of all of them is smoke rising forever and ever, because you find that exact same phrase in Isaiah 34.10, where it's describing smoke rising forever and ever from the wasteland into which Edom is turned. So it's a picture of the, the, the wasteland after a city is destroyed and then smoke rises it forever and ever. So, so, so the symbolism in Revelation 14 and 18 and 19 is drawing upon it from there. But even that's not where the imagery of smoke rising begins. S smoke rising begins evidently, or I mean, it could be even earlier, but the first one that comes to my mind is Genesis 19. Um, when Abraham is looking out at the plains after God has rained down Sodom and uh, or, or rained down fire and sulfur onto Sodom and Gomorrah, and what what the text says is that when Abram looked out over those plains after Sodom and Gomorrah were destroyed, he saw smoke rising like out of a furnace. So this picture of rising smoke is the kind of it, it evokes the kind of thought that we moderns have when we see a mushroom cloud. We think obliteration. That's what the symbol means, and that's why you see it used in both Revelation 14 and Revelation 19, because the picture of the harlot suffering forever is a symbol for the absolute eradication of the city, the absolute obliteration of the city that she represents. So Revelation 14, 9 to 11, not only does not teach the doctrine of eternal torment and challenge conditional immortality, it's actually the other way around. It's better support for your, in my view, Renee, and it challenges the doctrine of eternal torment very powerfully. Um, do you want to ask anything about that before we move on to the other passage in Revelation? Somewhere, I want to say Isaiah or Ezekiel, where the same language. Oh, for, I can't hear you. I only see your lips moving. You can, can you can you hear me, Ben? Maybe, you know what? It might have been. It might be my. Let me switch headphones. Hold on. Okay. My my headphones might have gone dead, and I may just not be hearing you. One second. Yeah, I think they did go dead. All right, hold on. Can you hear me now? Or can I hear you now? Can you hear me now? <laughs> yeah, so sorry, everybody. I, I have to wear the big bulky headphones. My earbuds died. I, I am very bad at remembering where things are. But <laughs> it might be Isaiah or Ezekiel where it talks about when there, this city was destroyed or its destruction is being foretold. This city is going to be destroyed. Not the one in Revelation. But it's the smoke rises forever or something. It's the same language. Yep. You use. And it, it to me, it's just look afar off that where that place used to be is a permanent exa uh, uh, um, example for us of God's justice. It's like that's yeah. the way of saying you'll always look at the rubble and it'll be a remembering what God did there. So. Yeah. Um, the same exact language. I can't, I wish I could remember. It's a smoke rises forever and it's about a destruction of some city. Yeah, it's so, Isaiah 3410. In fact, yeah, a couple of people have quoted it in the chat. Yeah. Okay. So, um, you know, I, I'm really glad that you mentioned that what's going on in Revelation because, yeah, like you mentioned, it's a multi headed beast. So it's not just talking about the beast as in the man of perdition. Right. It's also talking about a conglomerate of nations uh, with many, what, 10 kings or something? Well, or something. 
Yeah, I mean, we, we can disagree a little bit about the interpretation if it comes to it. But when when I read Revelation 17, I think it is, and the angel interprets the meaning of those heads for John, he says that he seems to indicate that those heads represent kings in a successive in a succession of kings, okay. but but not kings of different nations. It seems like he's talking about the successive kings successively ruling the same kingdom. Um, but that might the reason it may seem to that to me is because I think he's talking about Rome there. And of course, Rome was an empire with successive empires. Emperors. But, right. but, but the point is, yes, those heads represented individual leaders of either one nation or multiple. And so the, the beast is a symbol of an institution. A symbol. That's, my, yeah. that's my thing. It's not a an, just a person, the beast. So because a lot of people, they say, and the beast and the false prophet are, you know, where it says they were thrown in the lake of fire where the beast and the false prophet are as if they're still there, still burning. After a thousand years, they're still being tormented after a thousand years, not realizing the beast is actually uh, a symbol for what did you say, a, a conglomerate or something? I, I use the word institution, but but yeah, I mean the, the point is it's it, it's the it's the persecutive um, um, authority and power that a kingdom wields. So it's um, not a literal entity that's being thrown in the lake of fire. It's that's it's, right. To, to us, maybe John is seeing the, the end of that thing, the destruction of that thing, right? Well, yeah, I mean, I, I and, and this would bring us nicely to Revelation 20. So if you want, I could speak yeah, to that sure. for a moment because it'll what you just said will segue nicely into that. Um, so uh, in Revelation 20, remember what I said earlier, the book of Revelation records a vision in which um, entities are in fact tormented forever and ever. Um, I saw a couple of people in the chat asking questions as if what I just gotten done saying um, for some, you know, might not have been heard or what. But yeah, I'm a, I'm actually I'm absolutely affirming that what John sees in his vision is a pictorial representation of everlasting torment. But the question we have to ask ourselves is what does that symbolize in reality? Because again, going as far back as Joseph in prison, this is the way biblical prophetic visions work: is that the future is shown to somebody by means of symbolic imagery. So when we come to Revelation 20, yes, we've got this, this uh, scene in the imagery in Revelation 10, uh, to, uh, Revelation 20, verse 10, in which the devil, the beast, and the false prophet are thrown into the lake of fire and, and tormented there day and night forever and ever. But and then, of course, the text goes on to say that Hades will be emptied and the dead that were that come up out of Hades that aren't saved, you know, whose names aren't written in the Lamb's Book of Life, they will be thrown into the lake of fire as well, presumably to share the same fate, to be tormented forever and ever in the imagery. And I think that is, in fact, what's going on. So the question then becomes, what does this mean? And there's a whole lot I could say about this. And in fact, I've got a journal article coming out in the not too distant future in which I argue from this and other texts in Revelation that it all teaches our view. Um, and I've got presentations on YouTube that people can watch as well. So there's a lot more I could say here, but in the interest of time, I'll offer two reasons for thinking that this symbolism communicates annihilation, or at least a fate that includes annihilation, rather than everlasting torment. The first one is that it's not only the devil, the beast, and the false prophet and resurrected human beings who are thrown into the lake of fire. It's also death and Hades. If you look at verse 13, and, and I'm, I'll read here from the King James Version, it says, uh, the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell, there's Hades, death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And then it goes on to say in verse 14, um, death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. Now, here's what's critical about this. In the vision that John is seeing, death and Hades are not, um, they're not, uh, abstract entities, right? It's not the concept of death and it's not the object or the container or the place that we call Hades. That's not what appear in the vision that John is seeing. And we know that because if you go back to Revelation chapter 6, where the four horsemen of the apocalypse are talked about, the fourth rider in verse 8, its name is death and Hades followed him. So in John's vision, death and Hades are not the fact of dying, the, con the abstract concept of death and, and, the, and the place that is Hades. Rather, they are personal beings in the vision that represent death and the intermediate state. They're entities. So, what's that? They're entities in the vision. 
That's right. They're personal entities with thoughts and words and feelings and everything in the vision. But what that symbol represents is the fact of death and the fact of the intermediate state, the, the Hades, the underworld. So what that means then is that if we're going to say that resurrected humanity in um, this passage shares the same fate as the devil, the beast, and the false prophet, namely everlasting torment, then we better darn well say that so do death and Hades. These, these horsemen that John sees thrown into the lake of fire, they we better assume they're going to share that same fate as well. But the question is, what does that fate represent? What does it mean that these horsemen, death and Hades, are thrown into the lake of fire um, and tormented forever and ever? Well, just read a few verses later. Revelation 21, chapter or, 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 verse 4, God will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and hathanatos uk etsai eti, death shall be no more. So you see this picture of death and Hades, personal entities being thrown into the lake of fire and being tormented forever, is symbolism for the annihilation of death itself. And that's consistent with what Paul says back in 1 Corinthians 15. I talked about this earlier. If you, um, if you look at verse 26 of 1 Corinthians 15, Paul says the last enemy to be destroyed is death. And what's important is that that, that word destroyed translates, and here again, I'm sorry for those of you King James onlyists who don't value the underlying Greek. I, I can't help you there. But for those of you who do, the word destroyed in the King James Version translates a Greek verb, katargeo, that means to cause to cease to happen. So, so Paul is literally saying that the last enemy to be dis the last death will be the last enemy to be caused to cease to happen. Death will be annihilated. No one will ever die again. So when death so will happen, death will cease to occur. That's exactly right. So this is the first evidence I'm offering that this picture of beings being thrown into a lake of fire and tormented forever and ever symbolizes a fate that, at the very least, a fate that includes annihilation, because that's clearly what it means for death and Hades. And there's no reason to think that it means something different for the other things thrown into it. But there's a second reason that adds further support. Um, that, that tells us that this is not a picture of everlasting torment. Um, when we read in verse uh, 14 of Revelation 20, we read this, um, and here I'll quote from the King James to appease those people that I just insulted a moment ago. <laughs> uh, death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. Now, here's what's critical here. When we read this, our instinct, if we're not very familiar with how biblical prophetic visions work, is to think that what John is doing is giving you a label to describe what's going on in the vision. And so we say death and hell were cast into the lake of fire, So, and, and this is the second death. Okay, so death must mean something that has to do with being in the lake of fire. But that's not that's not how this functions. If you go all the way back to those visions I mentioned earlier, Joseph in prison, Joseph interpreting Pharaoh's dreams, uh, Daniel interpreting Nebuchadnezzar's vision, and so on and so forth. Um, in all of these visions, you have a dynamic between what happens in the imagery and what its interpretation is. And when they when people when the angels and Daniel and Joseph interpret what happens in the vision, they will say. The thing in the vision is this in reality. So, for example, and I'll, there, there's so many examples of this I could give, but I'll just give one. When when Joseph is interpreting Pharaoh's dream, Pharaoh had had this dream in which seven healthy cows come up out of the Nile, and then seven sick cows come up out of the Nile, and those seven six cow, sick cows eat the first seven cows. And what Joseph tells Pharaoh is that the seven cows are seven years. Notice what he's doing. He's saying X is Y. The, the image is these cows. They are seven years in reality. So when John says, and you can see this in the book of Revelation itself, back in chapter 17, for example, the angel tells John the seven heads are seven kings. Right. This is the way these people interpret imagery. Um, so when John says the lake of fire is the second death, he's not telling you death has something to do with being in a lake of fire. He's telling you this lake of fire and what takes place there symbolizes the second death. 
So then we have to ask ourselves, well, how would John's original readers have understood the phrase second death? And I would pose, I would posit that there are only two possible ways they could have understand it. And they're not mutually exclusive. Both could be equally true. Firstly, in all those visions I've mentioned, and even in Revelation itself, interpretation is delivered in, in plain, straightforward, ordinary language. In fact, it would fail to function as interpretation otherwise. If I told, if, if, if Joseph told Pharaoh, the seven cows are seven mysterious unicorns flying in the ether of the, you know, or use some weird, bizarre, esoteric language like that, he wouldn't be interpreting anything for Pharaoh. Pharaoh would be like, what in the world have you been smoking, right? No, 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 no. that's not how it works. You have to explain the imagery and language that the hearer would understand in order to reveal the meaning that is hidden in this mysterious imagery. So so how what would a second death mean to the hearers of John? It would mean dying a second time, which is what you and I believe will happen to the wicked, but it's what you know many people in your chat right now do not. But there's a second possible meaning of second death, or, or there may be a second reason why John uses that as the interpretation of the lake of fire. And that is, in the time of John, there were, uh, in terms of relevance, two translations of the Old Testament that were popular among the Jewish people. One was a translation of the Hebrew Old Testament into Greek. And that translation, and, and the word translation here is a little bit loose because a lot of that translation is in fact interpretation and paraphrase and rewording and stuff. But anyway, that translation of the Old Testament is called the Septuagint. Uh, if people ever hear the word Septuagint or see the letters LXX, that's what they're talking about, this Greek translation of the whole Hebrew Old Testament, which, by the way, many quotations in the New Testament are quoting from the, the Greek translation of the Old Testament known as the Septuagint. But there was another popular translation and paraphrase and interpretation of the Old Testament, this time into Aramaic. And that translation was called the Targums. Now, the reason I bring this up is because the phrase second death can be found nowhere in, uh, in Jewish literature except for Revelation, with the exception of the Targums. The Targums are the one other place in Jewish literature where we see the phrase second death used. And in some of those places, it's also, it, it also talks about Gehenna. But here's the fascinating thing. In all those places where the second death is used in the Targums, including the places where Gehenna appears alongside of it, it literally means to die a second time and to not participate in life in the age to come. So, so what I'm saying here is that by telling his readers that this lake of fire symbolizes the second death, he's doing one or both of two things. He's either saying... This lake of fire where things take place, that's the place where the wicked are going to die a second time. Or, or I should say, and or, because it could be both, he's saying that place, this lake of fire in my vision, that's that second death you rem you'll remember from the Targums. Either way, he's telling his readers that this lake, the fiery torment in the lake symbolizes literally dying a second time for human beings, um, which is the exact opposite of what the doctrine of eternal torment says will happen to human beings in the lake of fire. They will be immortal and physically live forever. So again, Revelation 20 does not at all challenge annihilationism. It challenges eternal torment, and I've yet to see any plausible defense of eternal torment from the book of Revelation since I've been studying it. Could you, because one of the things that really convinced me during my study was, like I said, so many verses telling us they're destroyed, uh, everlasting destruction, twice they're plucked up by the roots. Uh, I even remember reading something which I couldn't reconcile with Revelation, so I'm glad he explained it that he's talking, I believe, to Satan and talks about a fire consuming him from the inside out and he's nothing but a pile of ashes and it will be a horror to the people. I can't even remember where that was, but I, I believe it's to Satan. I'll, I'll have to find it. But I see also in Psalm 82 where he tells the unjust angelic realm, uh, the one, the principalities or whatever, you shall die like, like men, men. Yep. you shall fall like one of the princes. So they, they too, which were immortal beings, will die. They That's will right. Die. So could you give us some, uh, just a few, I know there's a plethora of them, 
some of the verses that are clear, just clear what happens to the lost, their ultimate end. Right. Well, we've already talked about one, right? John 3, 16, God so loves the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. We could also talk about Romans 6, 23, the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ, our Lord. Um, I'm not saying, and you're not saying that death means the cessation of existence. I don't know why Alan Sanchez in the chat keeps saying death is not non-existence, or maybe it was somebody else in the chat. I've never said that. Death is the cessation and ongoing privation of life. And um, and and that's the exact opposite of what the doctrine of eternal torment says will the will be the case with the lost in hell. They will be physically immortal and live forever in hell. Um, but if there were any doubt that by death Paul means death, is that in the, just a couple of verses later at the be beginning of chapter seven? And remember, regardless of how high esteem somebody holds the King James version in Paul, when he wrote Romans did not have chapter and verse numbers. So right. Paul goes in the span of just a couple of verses from saying the wages of sin is death to then saying when a spouse dies, his or her spouse is free to remarry. So what does Paul mean by death? He means death. It's right there in the context. So we got Romans 6, 23, we've got Matthew 10, 28, Jesus says to his disciples who are facing the very real prospect of being killed, he says to them, don't fear men who can kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear, fear the one, which is very clearly God, who can destroy both body and soul in Gehenna. The Gehenna, that's the permanent place, the lake that's, of fire. That's exactly right. And here's what's important. Um, the Greek word there does have a range of possible meanings, um, a range that includes things like losing, right? So the, the coin that's lost, the lost coin, that's the same verb, the lost sheep, the lost son, right? There are places there, let losing, wasting, and ruin are all within the range of this word, but everywhere the word is used in Matthew, Mark, and Luke in the way that it's used here, it is referring to literally killing a person. So, for example, when Herod um, is trying to trick the Magi into revealing to him where the baby Jesus is so he can kill the baby Jesus, the text says he wanted to destroy the baby Jesus. Now, Herod didn't want to lose or ruin or waste the baby Jesus. He wanted to slaughter him. And the same is true in Jesus's adult life when the Pharisees are said to have sought to destroy Jesus. They didn't want to separate Jesus from anybody. They didn't want to ruin or waste or lose Jesus. They wanted to kill him. And that's the case with all the places in Matthew, Mark, and Luke where the word destroy in Matthew 10, 28 is used in the same way. So that's a clear example of what's going to happen. Both body and soul will be slain in Gehenna. You won't have resurrected immortals living physically forever in hell. You could also look at Matthew 13 in the in one of the famous places where Jesus talks about weeping and gnashing of teeth. Uh, in verse 40, roughly, Jesus says that he, um, when he returns, um, his angels will root out of humankind all sinners and all uh, lawbreakers and throw them into a fir fiery furnace. There, he says, will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And every traditionalist says, see, clearly hell is eternal torment. Well, hold on. Hold on for a moment. Hold, cool your jets. Firstly, um, gnashing of teeth and weeping in Scripture is not about pain. It's about anger in the case of gnashing, and it's about remorse and grief and sadness in the case of weeping. So it's not about pain in the first place. But more importantly, um, Jesus is, is here at this part in, in Matthew 13. He is interpreting a parable that he'd just gotten done telling. That parable earlier is a parable in which at the end of the story, the landowner tells his servants to buy to, to gather up all the, all the weeds from amongst the tares, bind them, and then throw them into a fire to be burned. Now, here's what's really important. Um, well, two things. One is less important, which is that we all know what happens to weeds when you throw them into fire, right? They, they, don't, they don't remain weeds forever. They, they burn up to ash. But secondly, and more importantly, the Greek word that's translated burn there doesn't just mean to burn. It means to burn entirely. Um, in fact, it's the same word that's used in the Greek translation of Exodus 3, where Moses sees the bush burning, but it was not consumed. That text says the bush was kaio, that's the Greek word meaning to burn, but it was not 
katakayo that was not burned up, reduced to ashes. And Jesus says in this parable that the landowner tells his 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 servants, throw the wheat the, the weeds into the fire to be reduced to ashes. And then in interpreting the parable, he says, just as the tares are thrown into the fire to be burned, so will my angels throw the um, wicked into a fiery furnace. So the picture is not of people suffering forever. It's a people of being burned up. And of course, what's going to happen, even if you don't buy the gnashing meaning anger and weeping meaning sadness uh, argument, the fact remains that if you tie somebody to a stake and you burn them to death, Guess what you're going to hear a lot of until they die? Weeping and gnashing. But the text doesn't say it'll go on forever. And I'll just add one last thing, and then there's so much more. I mean, it's all over the place. But the one last thing I'll add here about Matthew 13 is that when he talks about this furnace of fire language, Jesus is alluding to Malachi 4, the very last chapter, if I'm not mistaken, of the whole Old Testament. And in that chapter... God says that the wicked will be reduced to ashes beneath the soles of your feet in a furnace of fire. So this is all language used to communicate in every imaginable way the execution, the slaying, the killing of God's enemies, and the getting rid of their remains. That's what all of this is. There simply is no basis in any of this or anywhere else in the Bible for thinking that the resurrected lost will be made immortal and live forever in hell. And again, they have to be made immortal. That's right. They would have to be given immortality or eternal life, then be tormented. So God would have to grant life to lost people. He would have to yep. give eternal life to the lost, give them some kind of immortal body that burns but does not burn up. And then that opposes all of the verses that explain there'll be ashes under your feet. Uh, a lot of people get tripped up on things like everlasting punishment or ever, mm -hmm. you know, everlasting destruction because they think it literally means their destruction is everlasting. Not that it's... Well, uh, to, to be a little more precise, I think what, what I would say is that they think that the destroying yeah. and the punishing go on forever when that's not what the text says. Punishment and punishing are two different... Yeah, one is the process of it. So the, the difference is they believe the process goes on and is consciously felt for all. I can't, I don't even know if human beings can conceptually understand forever, like infinity in any direction. Like our minds just cannot even fathom it. Yet somehow we've been taught that this, this torment will just go on to in a, in a way that we can never Never. It'll be a million years and, and you'll still be. Well, just be careful, though, because even even though you're right, it is difficult to envision what it would be like to be tormented literally for all eternity. It's equally true that it's really difficult to imagine what it would be like to live in bliss for all eternity. Right. But, we know, but we know that's going to happen. Absolutely. But yeah. my thing is we're we have no real concept of it. And to think either one is really inconceivable for us. We, we have no ability. We can kind of imagine it. But what I, I is harder for me is to think after whatever amount of time, because see, I can't even speak in that language because I'm not in eternity. There is no time in eternity. So well, why do you say that? I mean, that, that could be an interesting conversation all of itself. Why do you think there's no time in eternity? Do you know what time is? Do you know what time is even necessary for any movement or thought or action whatsoever? That's true. You can't <laughs> yeah, I think if things moving is it. Time has to exist through. Yep, because time and space are intermingled. Um. So, uh, oh, what I was gonna say is the weeping and gnashing of teeth thing. I also uh, came to the conclusion that it meant anger or resentment. Because Jesus tells the uh, Pharisees that you're going to see Gentiles, you're going to see people come from the east and the west and sit down at the table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the patriarchs, and you yourselves cast out. We be in right. resentment and anger that the Gentiles are sitting down and them, the bloodline of Abraham, because that's what they thought was saving them, won't be there. Yep. And resentment. And I, there's another place. I think you used it once. What was the other place where the gnashing gnashed their teeth at somebody? It's in several places, but but I don't remember them off the top of my head. I think Stephen. I think when they were 
they got mad at Stephen when they were going to stone him and they gnashed their teeth at him. I think it was a, uh, they were angry. So I think it's important to let the Bible, you know, interpret what those things mean. And I, I absolutely agree with you. It's, it's anger, uh, not pain. Although I'm sure there'll be some pain going on when you really, you know, that you realize well, like, what you're out on. Well, well, and like I said, you know, if, if, as I believe the wicked are going to be burned up, um, when people burn to death, it's not a silent affair. No, uh -uh. <laughs> so okay. I really don't know what people, why they think there's some problem with weeping and gnashing being consistent with annihilation. But also, uh, the, the process of someone burning up, I, I don't know. I, I've never seen anybody burned at the stake, but I would imagine it's horrific and it's not done too quickly. And, and I would think it'd be very painful um, so I, I don't know why that doesn't seem to be enough for some people. They kind of feel like that's not enough justice or something. I don't get that perspective, but I do hear that also. For me, everything just is clearer in scripture now. Like yeah. death means death. It means what it says, says what it means. Life means life. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Life, yeah. eternal life is literally living forever in the presence of the Lord in an immortal body. Death is, you're, you're dead. So um, it just makes sense. Everything's clear now. But I wanted to, I wrote a couple other things down. Um, I'm not oh, in any sort of extreme how, hurry, just so you know. So don't feel like you've got to rush. Uh, how did this? Because I've seen some ancient writings, letters, where people didn't believe in eternal conscious torment, they clearly believed in the destruction of the wicked in the first century some places. Not all of them, but I, I believe it was a very uh, acceptable view to have at one point. How did, one, it become unacceptable, and two, how did eternal conscious torment come to be read into the scriptures and accepted as orthodoxy? Very good questions, and, and I just want to say, and, and don't take this as me just trying to butter you up, you're you're very astute and very knowledgeable, and, and I just want you to know that I think very highly of you. Um, so uh, people that defend eternal torment have very often perpetuated the, the, the mistaken claim that Christians have believed in eternal torment for 2,000 years. It's They simply haven't. If you go back to the earliest writings we have from within the church, um, we have Clement of Rome from somewhere right around the turn of the century, so 90 to 100 AD, right around there. We've got Ignatius of Antioch from the same period of time. Uh, Epistle of Barnabas, again, right around the same period of time. The Didache. Um, these, these are all the earliest church father's writings we have, and every one of them um, appears to teach the view that you and I are here representing. You go even a little bit further to the latter half of the second century, so right around 150 AD or so, you come to Irenaeus of Lyon, and he is an incredibly um, respected church father, and he believes the view and teaches the view that you and I hold. Um, you see this view taught by possibly um, Athanasius the Great, the one who stood for Orthodox Trinitarianism while most of the rest of the church started to go to um, Arianism. Um, and it's taught by a church father who has some questionable beliefs in other areas named Arnobius. Um, so, so you've got from the very beginning this stream of uh, Christians who believe in what you and I believe, and the earliest Christians all did as far as the historical record seems to indicate. Now, what happened, though, in the latter half of the second century, right around the same time uh, as Irenaeus, whom I mentioned a moment ago, you had a couple of church fathers named Tatian of Adiabene, I think is how you pronounce the town that he's from, and Athenagoras of Athens. And these two church fathers, if I'm not mistaken, are both converts to Christianity from pagan worldviews. And that's also, by the way, true of Tertullian and Augustine, other church fathers after them who taught the doctrine of eternal torment. And so what I think happened is that the earliest Christians, um, uh, some of whom were not possibly uh, uh, converts to Christianity from pagan religions, I just don't know, they seem to have taught the right view, taught the view that their um, forefathers, the, the Christians that we read about in the Bible, um, taught what they taught. but then 
as more and more Christians, or sorry, as more and more pagans are becoming con converted to Christianity, especially from pagan worldviews where um, uh, uh, where souls are everlasting. Um, they come into the faith and they come with glasses on. And this happens to all of us, right? I'll give you one example. When I became a, um, uh, a Christian, I had been fully convinced of um, biological common descent evolution. I, that's what I, again, remember I was an atheist and this is just what I was taught in school and I assumed that was the case. And guess what I continued therefore to believe when I became a Christian? I continued to believe in evolution. It wasn't, and it's, and I thought at first that what I was reading was compatible with that. Now I'm not here to start a debate with anybody in the chat that does believe in evolution. That's not my point. My point is you continue to read what you come to through lenses that you don't even know you're wearing. And that will cause you to read things there that aren't actually there. Uh, by way of analogy, imagine you were born with blue sunglasses on and you didn't know it. And you went through whole, your whole life wearing blue sunglasses, never knowing it. And somebody finally says to you as an adult, um, what color is the world to you? You wouldn't say blue. You wouldn't know what blue is as, as, distinct, as distinct from anything else. You would say, what do you mean? I just see the world as it is. And then all of a sudden you take those blue sunglasses off and holy cow, the world's a lot different than I thought. Well, the same thing happened uh, evidently with Tatian and Athenagoras and Tertullian and Augustine. They came into Christianity having formerly believed that humans have everlasting souls. And so they, and mind you, they're not Jews either. So they're not familiar with Jewish language, Jewish idioms, Jewish uh, uh, prophecy, and so forth. They come into the church. They're unfamiliar with those conventions. They have this pre existing belief in everlasting souls. So, what's going to happen when they come across phrases like everlasting fire, everlasting punishment, torment forever in a lake of fire? They're going to take those things um, in ways that already are compatible with what they already believe because they already believe them. So I think that's what happened. People, converts to Christianity from other worldviews and, and from cultures where those expressions and conventions weren't familiar, they, they, they committed themselves to Scripture. I'm not at all calling into question their commitment to Scripture, but just like is the true of all of us, they came to Scripture with presuppositions and biases, and, um, and they didn't even realize that they were reading the text through that lens. So that's where the doctrine arose. It was because of influence from pagan converts to Christianity. The reason it became the Hold dominant. Did you yeah, guys sure. hear that? I wanted to make sure they heard that, that a lot of the pagan Greeks, Gentiles, got converted and brought their pagan ideas about the afterlife and the immortality of the soul into the church, not understanding the Jewish symbolism and the idioms used in the Old Testament. And that's how this emerged. I just right. to make sure people heard that. I appreciate that. No, that's good. Um, that's how it emerged. But then, of course, there's a question of how did it become the Christian view, right? The one that almost all Christians have held since about the time of Augustine. And I think the answer to that question is Augustine. You see, um, not that there's any weight to this identification, but but historically Christians have identified a small handful of what they've called the great fathers of the church. And there are a couple of Eastern fathers and a couple of Western fathers, and they call them great because their influence, their prestige, even in some cases their intelligence and their, um, you know, whatever, their creativity in a number of ways uh, surpassed all the other church fathers even. Well, one of those great fathers was Augustine. And Augustine was at one time a, um, a, a Platonist, a, you know, an adherent to, to Plato and his worldview. At another time in his history, he was a Manichaean. Both uh, both Manichaeism and uh, Platonism believed in the everlastingness of souls. So he comes from both of those worldviews where, you know, he's just inundated with the belief that his soul and everybody else's soul is going to exist forever. And then he becomes a Christian and he continues to read texts through that lens and he does a whole lot of great theological work for the church and becomes a great father. Well, then what happens when one of these great fathers of the church puts his proverbial stamp of approval on the doctrine of eternal torment in a day and age where our view, eternal torment, and universalism were all viable options? Um, 
there are some people in the chat who've I met, who I saw mention that universalism is heresy, and I'm not here to argue otherwise. But at least at that time, almost you know, 1700 years ago, roughly, universalism was a popular Christian belief. So too was annihilationism, and so too was eternal torment. But then this great father, Augustine, puts a stamp of approval on the doctrine of eternal torment. And so, of course, it becomes the prevailing view. And then it all just sort of snowballs from there. So a little bit later, you have a council at which universalism is possibly condemned as heresy. Um, fast forward to about 1100 AD, and you have the Roman Catholic Church condemning annihilationism as heresy. Thankfully, we're not Roman Catholics, so I would like to think that the people in the chat don't hold that in any esteem. Um, and then you have the modernist, fundamentalist modernist controversy of the late 19th and early 20th centuries. You see, what happened was in the in post enlightenment era, um, some professing Christians were giving a lot of weight to um, uh, to secular ideas like evolution and other things. And um, one of those things that a lot of these liberalized and modernized Christians um, believed in was that eternal torment was not true. They weren't typically annihilationists. Many of them were universalists. But anyway, the point is, is that the fundamentalists who had a very strong commitment, rightfully so, to the authority and truthfulness of scripture, they said, well, gosh, we, we've got to define what the fundamentals of the faith are because there are so many of them that are being denied by these liberals and these moderns. And one of the things they saw liberals and moderns denying was eternal hell. And so in their list of fundamentals they come at, came up with was everlasting hell. And so all the very conservative Orthodox Christians that held to annihilation were suddenly deemed heretics by the fundamentalists. And then the fun and, and the fundamentalists became an incredibly influential group leading into the 20th century and even to today. And um, what has happened is that annihilationism has become unfairly and unjustifiably associated with liberalism and modernism and the Jehovah's Witnesses and the Seventh-day Adventists and others, so that any time a Christian like me, who is none of those things, makes a biblical case, like I've been doing today, for the truth of this view, the first thing that most Christians think is either liberal, modernist, Jehovah's Witness, or Adventist. So the, the, the fundamentalists have done a really good job of making Christians think heretic when they hear annihilation. And if your first gut instinct is, or if the first thing you think of when you think of annihilation is heresy, well, then of course you're not going to give it a fair hearing. You're not going to embrace it for fear of losing your relationships and, and being kicked out of your churches and being unable to be hired at, at seminaries. And it, all of those things I've just mentioned are literally happening today. People are being kicked out of their churches for holding to uh, annihilationism. They're, they're not being allowed to uh, teach at some seminaries. They're being fired from ministries. It's, it's a real shame. It grieves the heart of the Lord. But that's why it remains the dominant view now, because even questioning it, even for a moment, risks being treated in the way that some of the people in the chat are treating you and me, as heretics, as wicked, as unbelievers. And so, of course, it's like peer pressure in school. You don't want to, you don't want to risk facing that kind of nastiness. So you just blissfully unaware, continue to believe what you believe and not give the alternative views a fair hearing because you're just, you've just accepted that they're all heretics. So that's a bit of a history lesson. Of course, it's a biased one. Your listeners can certainly take it with a grain of salt. But that's how I think that the doctrine of eternal torment arose and came to be the dominant view that it is today. Yeah, I, I see the same thing. And I was surprised to see some of the other uh, doctrines being considered early on, too. Um, but I, I wanted to say something here. Uh, a common theme I'm seeing, again, I would like to reiterate, my purpose for doing this is to have a conversation with my brothers and sisters in Christ. It is to show you that I have a biblical scriptural reason for my position. It is not to convince you to come over to my side. I don't gain brownie points or get rewards in heaven or anything like that. I'm only trying to, to get you to not divide with your brothers and sisters in Christ that may have different beliefs on these things than you if they are scriptural and can be supported scripturally without twisting them all up with that being said 
I saw some of the things that were being said that it's dangerous to take all the verses that say everlasting uh, punishment and say it's just metaphoric and then take everlasting life. I'm not saying everlasting isn't everlasting. That, that's, that, right. that, that, that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying we're the words are not, you're implying eternal conscious torment whenever you see everlasting or eternal. You're assuming that, that the process involves a person living immortally in conscious pain forever. When it's everlasting, it means forever. For I agree, it's forever, and that is literal. <laughs> if I might, if I might speak to Matthew twenty five forty six for a moment, um, that's the verse you're talking about, and I might, I might be able to help clarify a little bit. Um, we annihilationists, most of us anyway, certainly us at Rethinking Hell and you as well, Renee, we aren't saying that the punishment is anything less than everlasting. Um, some annihilationists do unfortunately argue that the word eternal means like having to do with the age to come. Or I think that's nonsense. I think it means everlasting, in, uh, eternal, never ending, just like it does with eternal life. But here's what's critical. What is everlasting is not said to be torment there. It's not said to be punishing there. It is said to be punishment. The punishment is what's everlasting. People aren't said to be eternal and nothing like that. So what we have to ask ourselves is from the context, what is this punishment that will last forever? And I would argue that there are a host of indications in the context of Matthew 25 that clearly indicate that the punishment that is everlasting is the punishment of being dead, the punishment of being dead, the punishment of death, not having life. One example of that is the fact that he says that this is going to be inflicted by means of eternal fire. He says that in verse 41, and if you go to Matthew 18, just a few chapters earlier, he uses that phrase eternal fire as a parallel for Gehenna, which, as we've already talked about, is the eschatological picture of punishment in which God kills and burns up his enemies, not makes them immortal and lives forever. But secondly, notice that the contrast, let me put it this way, in, in verse 46 of Matthew 25, Jesus is doing both a parallel and a contrast. The parallel is in their durations, right? He uses the exact same Greek adjective, Ionios, which means everlasting. The life will be everlasting, and so will the punishment. But the context here means that punishment and life are mutually exclusive. If you want to say these go to eternal life, but these go to eternal life too, then you're not really offering a contrast, right? The one is living forever. The other punishment that lasts forever cannot be life forever. So then what must the punishment be in order to be an everlasting punishment and not entail living forever? It must be everlasting death. And if people have a problem with, with trying to figure out how um, a punishment inflicted at a point in time, like the death penalty, you know, you, you, people are killed relatively briefly, how could that punishment be called everlasting? Well, consider that the author of Hebrews does the same thing with that adjective Ionios. He talks about Jesus securing everlasting redemption and everlasting salvation. But of course, it would be heresy to say that Jesus for all eternity future will still be saving us and still be redeeming us. No, Jesus redeemed us and saved us at a point in time by means of his crucifixion. But the result of that act was salvation. It, the a result of that process was redemption. And that result lasts forever. So likewise, with everlasting punishment, the punishment of death is inflicted relatively briefly. You're killed. But provided that the result of that, the punishment of being dead, lasts forever, then it's an everlasting punishment. So as you can see, yet again, Matthew 25, 41 to 46 is not a challenge for us. It's a challenge for our brothers and sisters in the chat who think that everlasting punishment means everlasting life. No, it doesn't, because everlasting life, Jesus says, is something only coming to the righteous. Here's the verse a few people have brought up. And it amazes me because you really do, when you step back, 
we we should look at this and myself guilty as well so please don't think i'm condemning anyone i'm making a point of how we all have biases and read into things based on our own bias the verse in daniel 12 this ah. is the quote they use and many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt now when, right. when i see that i think they're going to wake up they're going to be resurrected they're going to stand before god they're going to be ashamed knowing they could have had of eternal life through christ and everlasting contempt to me means that it's permanent they'll never be reconciled to god they'll always be spoken of with contempt or if anybody remembers them but you know what i'm saying it's contempt is permanent they are never reconciled to God. This is a permanent thing that happens. So when it says everlasting contempt, why do we assume that implies everlasting? Uh, they're going to feel the contempt for everlasting. Like the person themselves is going to feel the contempt for everlasting. I believe contempt, they're going to be in everlasting shame. They're going to be away from God forever. They're not going to have life with god just like they have everlasting life these people have everlasting contempt it's a permanent thing it's not reversible it's done but when people look at that we put into our presupposed tradition that everlasting contempt with the thought in the back of our head that somehow that's conscious and lasting forever you see what i mean how something's not there but I do. I absolutely see what you're saying. I think that part of it, and I'm trying here to be charitable to them, um, part of it may be that when when the, the text says, both in the King James and the original Hebrew, shame and everlasting contempt. But sometimes we get that mixed up and we think it says everlasting shame and contempt, as if everlasting, that adjective, refers to both shame and contempt. Now, the reason why that could account for the kind of confusion that you're describing is because shame um, and contempt are not the same thing. Right. They're, like, they're like two sides of the same coin. When you feel shame, that's you feeling ashamed of what you've done. But contempt is how other people think of you. Mm -hmm. There you go. In fact, the word contempt there appears in only one other place in the whole Old Testament, at least the Hebrew underlying word, and that's Isaiah 66, 24, where it's corpses that are said to be contemptible to the righteous. So all this text can say, you, you simply cannot, there's simply no way to turn this text into support for eternal torment. The most that you can say about it is that the wicked will not rise to everlasting life, Okay, so right off the bat, it's not the eternal torment. <laughs> um, but, but more than that, you could say that when they rise, they experience shame, but it doesn't say it's everlasting. And it says that they will be thought of negatively forever by God, by the righteous, whatever. That's it. You can't get everlasting torment out of this verse. And in fact, two reasons, two indications give uh, make it clear that this is in fact annihilation. Firstly, only the righteous are said to rise to everlasting life. And secondly, the only other place where that word contempt is used is in a place where it's talking about dead bodies killed in Gehenna and eaten up by fire and maggots. This is not a picture of eternal torment. It's a picture of the kind of death that Renee and I have been talking about. And again, I want to remind everybody we're, we're not spending much time on the intermediate state, the uh, place uh, the dead go before the final judgment. That's not the big topic tonight. It's ultimately what happens to the lost, what happens to the wicked. And uh, here, uh, I, I don't, I don't know. I, I, I don't know why we hold on to this but it's so long and i i want to say please just study for yourself and what what i personally did is i made a list of every verse as i went through scriptures of what happens to the wicked all the verses that say this is a symbol or what's going to happen to the lost or this is an example or an example of what will happen uh any verses that talk about the last day or the judgment 
and I put them side by side and I was left with two or three verses that I saw. Most of them were in the book of Revelation, which were symbolic. So I, I had a choice to make and it took me a long time. I did not come quickly away from the popular view. And again, I, I don't care if you do or not. I'm hoping that you'll you'll be less dogmatic and not. There's some things I believe we do not unite in error on the divinity of Christ, the gospel, the name of few. But there's some things that I don't think that we should be so dogmatic that we break fellowship, call people heretics, call people names, slander them, attack them, tear down their ministry, because most of the time we have not even heard them. And it's very frustrating. I can't tell you how many times I've done videos with so much work and study. And I'll explain a verse right there in the video and they'll put, but what about this verse? No, <laughs> nobody's even listen to me. Like nobody's even hearing me. And, and it's, it's hard. So I think we should hear each other. Just hear it. You don't have to believe it, but just hear it with an open mind. Be willing to not, you know, get angry yeah. at others for disagreeing. And that's what I, I'm really hoping to accomplish here is just so that you will understand this position is not heretical. It is scriptural and biblical. It was accepted until uh, later on. And it was kind of pushed out by like peer pressure, pretty much. Uh, and I think Augustine or Augustine, he he was a big guy. And it sounds like his, his he was very respected and what he said. And and and, and deservedly so. I'm not at all yeah. denigrating Augustine. He deserved his respect. Right. Yeah. So I mean, it 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 is what it is. But I I don't think I just don't want anybody. Uh, leaving with a sour taste in their mouth over this. This is supposed to be a discussion that brothers and sisters in Christ can have. And I'm asking us to have open ears for each other because a lot of times I see where it's la, 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 yeah, but, but, la, 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 but this, but this, but this, and they're not hearing anything the other person says. And I, I can be guilty of that as well. And I try to be more aware of that so I can hear what others um, believe also. So I'm asking again to just please hear it. You, you not trying to convert you to my position. Uh, I just wanted you to understand why I believe it. And it's not based on any kind of need uh, to match God's nature or this is what I want to be true or any of that stuff. It's just what I see in the scriptures. In fact, I'll just add this. Um, there are at least two ways in which my emotions draw me back to the tradition. Firstly, I would be so it would be so much easier for me in ministry, in life, if I believed in eternal torment. I wish I could, uh, because as a very conservative, reformed, inerrant, inerrancy believing, young earth creationist, uh, evangelical Christian, this view is uh, for, for this view. I am very I am treated very poorly, very often, and I'd much rather avoid all that. A second reason, and this is going to be hard for some of your um, chat, the people in chat, to relate to, but it'll be easy for others of them because we each have different in intuitions, but I actually find cessation of existence even more terrifying than living forever in torment. Now, don't that's not just me. Augustine said that. Uh, the first century historian Plutarch said that. It's a very common refrain all throughout human history that ceasing to exist is even more fearful than living forever, even if that living forever is experienced negatively. Um, now, I'm not saying that's something everybody, an intuition everybody shares. I'm just saying there literally is no possible way that my uh, holding on to this view is me trying to shoehorn something I want to believe into scripture. Quite the contrary. I would very much love to be able to shoehorn eternal torment in there, but I can't. I so, yeah, I just wanted to add that. Yeah, and thank you for saying that. Because mm -hmm. seriously... If I thought it said that, I would believe it and accept it. so much and easier. Yeah. And I would have to say, okay, well, it's God. Who am I to judge God? I'm just going to accept what it says. So um, I did want it to be clear that my motive is not to, you know, to stir things up or to convert people to my thinking or 
it, it's just to be understood. I, I literally did not speak publicly unless I was poked at, you know, poked me with a stick before I'd even mention my position because I knew once I said that, their ears would be shut to me. They All hell would break loose, excuse yeah, the pun. Yeah. <laughs> they, wouldn't, they wouldn't hear anything I said. Yeah. So um, I, that, I'm so grateful that you came uh, to talk to us on this. Um, what was this? I had another thing I did not want to forget. Let me see. That's okay. Go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, because, um, again, I don't know how much longer you want to have me on, but I, I do want to um, field any questions that we have time yes. for from people in the chat. So I just don't forget to give a few of those to me. Yes. If you guys want to, if you don't mind, because the chat's moving pretty quickly tonight, those of you guys that had questions, please put them in all caps now, because I cannot remember all the questions that were being put up earlier. All right, so we'll give it a couple minutes. Maybe while we're waiting, I can address a, uh, Alan Sanchez's question. Of course, please. He says, if rich man, if the rich man in the intermediate state is in torment of the flame, as he said, it can certainly continue. As Jesus said, the flame would not be quenched. So um, I'm not denying that the flames couldn't go on. The question is what the text says will happen. And the flame not being quenched does not mean it will never die out. That's a common misunderstanding. So if you look at the um, places in Scripture where fi God's fiery wrath is said to be unquenchable, it always means what quench means, which is put out. It doesn't mean die out. Um, here's an analogy. If you were at work and you got a call while you were at work and it was a fireman telling you, hey, we're at the fire department where you're we're at your house and we're trying to quench a fire that is burning down your house. You better run home and we're going to do our best to quench it. Now imagine you get there and all that's left is smoke, you know, smoldering, smoking remains. Um, Imagine the fire person came up to you and said, hey, congratulations, we quenched your fire. See, there's nothing burning anymore. Oh, well, that's baloney. They failed to quench that fire, for which reason it completely burnt it up. Um, that's how this language of unquenchable fire is used in all, all throughout Scripture. And I'll give you just one example. Matthew 3, 12, I think it is, where John the Baptist says that Jesus will, um, uh, will, will, well, here, I'll pull it up. Um, it's Matthew, I think it's Matthew 3, 12. Yeah, his winnowing fork is in his hand and he will clear his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. Now, if our brother Alan in the chat were right that unquenchable fire means it will never die out, well, okay, but it still burns up. There's that Greek word katakayo, the, the chaff. You see, the point of it being unquenchable is that it can't be put out. And because it can't be put out, it burns up. Katakayo is the Greek word there. Um, in fact, the King James Version uses burn up. Um, all you King James Version uh, people, um, it, the chaff is burned up by unquenchable fire. So even if you think it goes on forever, the point of it being unquenchable is that you can't put it out, and so it will do exactly what fire is meant to do. All right, so I'll, I'll let you now ask me what questions uh, yeah, you want to put. Yeah, so that being said, I wanted to make one more point. You know, we see the words eternal fire, I, I, I've always thought it just meant it came from an eternal source. It's not a natural fire. And that comes well, from what Jude said. And another reason I started to believe that the, the wicked perish and are destroyed is because Jude tells us that Sodom and Gomorrah is an example of what's going to happen to the wicked. Even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh, are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire, but it's not still burning. Sodom and Gomorrah is a heap and a ruin, just nothing but pieces of brimstone in the sand. So, um, you know, the words eternal fire often trip people up also, I think. Can, 
Well, and as you pointed out, eternal fire is a phrase that Jude uses to refer to the fire that came down from heaven and killed the inhabitants of Sodom and Gomorrah. That's why the parallel in 2 Peter 2.6 calls it reducing Sodom and Gomorrah to ashes as an example of what awaits the wicked. Eternal fire is also a pretty close to what Isaiah speaks of in Isaiah 33.14 when he asks rhetorically, who among us can dwell with everlasting burnings? And we know that's talking about annihilation as well, being burned up, because he, because he also asks as a parallel, who among us can dwell with the consuming fire? And the answer to that rhetorical question is either one of the following two. Either it's nobody at all, or it's only the righteous. It could be the righteous, because in the very next verse, it says, he who walks righteously and speaks uprightly, right? So that person might be able to dwell with the everlasting burnings. Or it could mean no one, because just a few verses earlier, it says the peoples will be as if burned to lime, like thorns cut down that are burned in the fire. So this language of everlasting burnings, everlasting fire, is not fire in which people burn forever, it's the fire of God himself, the quintessential um, everlasting fire, the consuming fire, who burns up his enemies like he did in Sodom and Gomorrah. Um, eternal fire is not at all about eternal torment. Good, because I, I think that's a stumbling block too. But it's just unfamiliarity or putting our own ideas into what certain things mean. Um, and again, it was the Bible itself that changed the meanings of those yep. uh, for me. Now I asked a, a, a minute ago it, to put their questions in. So I'm going back to see what they were. And Megan wants to know, do you have any great Poupon? <laughs> no, I am not a fan of honey mustard. I like, I love yellow mustard, but not honey mustard. And uh, the next viewer here, who was it? Um, wanted to know, Oh, Hey, switch. Hi daddy. Hope the baby's doing good. Uh, wanted to know what translation do you prefer, uh, if not the King James? Um, my go-to, like the one I, st I, I start with anytime I crack open a Bible, is the English Standard Version, the ESV. But I actually think it's really important that we consult a variety of translations. So I like the ESV, the NASB. I kind of like the NIV. I like the NET. I like the NLT. Um, the, the Holman Christian Standard Bible, which now is just the Christian Standard Bible, uh, that's a good one. There's a lot of good ones. I just think people should avoid, and, and I think the King James is decent. It's just really hard to understand a lot of places and in places it's simply wrong um, because it's it's a, a, a poor manuscript tradition that it's reflecting. Um, the New King James Version is pretty good too. I just I, I, I don't think there is any one that everybody should use. I think people should consult a variety and, and should not only use the King James because it's got some problems. So yeah, when we do our Bible study, we, we have King James and then we have two other ones as well. And sometimes we like what they say, and other times we think, ah, eh, that that doesn't really reflect what's being said here. Sometimes they're off, but that's why it's good to have a few, you know, right. to look at and compare them. But I like, I, I'm not a Greek or Hebrew scholar by any stretch, but I like going back and, uh, and seeing uh, what the roots mean, what the actual words meant in that language. And it's kind of difficult because it's so colorful. Greek is so colorful. Um, so, Alan, now he didn't post this question, but I, I want to mention it because I fear maybe, uh, hi, Alan, I fear maybe you didn't uh, hear um, Chris when he was explaining uh, Revelation and how hell and death were represented in the vision by actual entities. Hell and death were represented in the vision of John by an entity. Liter there were riders on a horse because he said hell is cast into the lake of fire hell doesn't cease to exist so maybe if you if you you know watch this again and go back i know we were talking fast you can see uh what that meant um that he talks about death death is destroyed it ceases um, yeah in in the imagery it seems as if these these horsemen, Death and Hades, are tormented forever and ever, along with everybody else thrown into the lake of fire. But the text itself tells us that what it means is that death will be no more, which is consistent with 1 Corinthians 15 and others. So the picture of entities tormented forever and ever in a lake of fire is symbolism consistent with a fate that includes death, not everlasting life. I, I'm not sure what this question is. Maybe 
All right. Someone wrote, do you think it's normal for some Christians to think conditional hell belief is wrong because Jehovah's Witnesses believe it? It is very normal. And this is what I was talking about earlier, that you ask uh, 10 Christians at random, in America at least, um, what comes to your mind when you hear annihilationism? And, and many of those 10 will tell you it's what those Jehovah's Witnesses believe, right? But here, but consider there are a couple of problems with this. First of all, Jehovah's Witnesses, heretical as they are, also believe in the inerrancy of Scripture. They believe in monotheism. So what are we supposed to do? Throw those out because the Jehovah's Witnesses believe them? Similarly, but conversely, you know who believes in eternal torment? The Westboro Baptist Church. Muslim. Um, Muslims. Uh, Appalachian snake wranglers who think that they can survive snake bites and stuff. I mean, um, there are all sorts of pseudo-Christian and non-Christian religions that believe in eternal torment, just like there are Christian denominations and, and pseudo-Christian ones that, do that don't. But here's the thing, and this is incredibly important. Annihilationism didn't begin with Jehovah's Witnesses, and it didn't begin with Seventh-day Adventists either. Quite the opposite. Seventh-day Adventists and Jehovah's Witnesses believe in annihilationism because Christians before them believed in annihilationism. You see, what happened in the early 19th century is that Christians like me who started to believe this view, many of them were either voluntarily or in many cases involuntarily leaving their churches— and they they formed, many of them, what was called the Millerite movement, uh, led by uh, something Miller and Joseph Campbell or whatever. And from that movement branched out the Jehovah's Witnesses and the Seventh-day Adventists, the Adventists and some others. So it's because a lot of the Christians in that Millerite movement believed in annihilationism that eventually Jehovah's Witnesses and other groups did. So there's just the, the fact that Jehovah's Witnesses believe in annihilationism literally has no bearing on this discussion at all whatsoever. Right. Uh, even a broken clock is right twice a day. <laughs> Good point. Uh, let's see. All right. Now. Uh, Chris and I did not get into philosophical arguments for this. We only looked at what the scripture said, uh, not any philosophy on it, not our opinion of whether we think eternal torment is right or wrong or any of that. But this is uh, one of those questions. It says, uh, is eternal torment a just punishment from a perfect God? If not, why not? So this is a good question. Um, I am inclined to say it would be a just punishment if that's indeed what God prescribed. Um, and I've never had a problem with a philosophical objection to eternal torment. But I will say this, there is something I struggle, um, and this is not a struggle I had prior to becoming an annihilationist. It's something that I've started to think about since. I struggle to think about how justice can ever finally be done in eternal torment. And the reason is because in, in the doctrine of eternal torment, um, the way that Christians have typically justified it, said, you know, they, they tried to explain how it could be God, a just for God to do this, is they will say one of one or both of two things. Either an infinite or any sin against an infinitely holy God merits an infinite penalty, or while they're being punished in hell, they're committing further sins for which they require additional punishment. All right. Now consider this, whichever one of those two is true, what it means is that at any given moment in eternity in hell, there's not, there's still justice yet to be done. There's still sin yet to be punished. Whether that's because uh, they need to undergo an infinite punishment or because while they're being punished, they're sinning more. Either way, justice is never done. Whereas in our view, justice is finally and forever accomplished when the wicked are no more. So I don't think that I don't think eternal torment is unfair. Like I don't think there's anything disproportionate there. I just think that it makes a lot more sense that justice is finally accomplished rather than it's never fully accomplished. And I'll add this. Um, in the traditional view, God hates sin. But he doesn't hate it bad enough to get rid of it. He only hates sin bad enough to guarantee that sin exists forever by making sinners immortal in hell. So he supernaturally, miraculously guarantees that sin goes on for eternity in the doctrine of eternal torment. My God hates sin so much, he finally gets rid of it once and for all. Right. 
Right. And that's what I see. Also, death is destroyed. And yeah. this is victorious. You know, I, I look at the Old Testament and I say, OK, uh, how did God deal with murderers? How did God deal with some capital punishment? That, that's what he did. He didn't put him in a cage and and beat him every day or uh, keep him in there for 50 years and then let him out. It was capital punishment. So uh, I look at God's sense of justice, even in this fallen world, and it, it, it everything. Again, death means death and life means life. It, everything and eternal is eternal. Nobody's denying it's eternal. But the, the actual process of it is not ongoing. It's just right. eternal ramifications. It's forever that way. They're never ri risen to life. They're never reconciled to God. It's done. And to me, it is more tragic because basically all the things you accomplished, all the sufferings you endured, it was all for nothing. It had been better if you'd never been born. And that's why it makes sense for me. No, when, 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 uh, I think when Jesus said it, didn't he have been better for Jesus if he'd never been born? Yeah. What was the point of all he went through? He ended up killing himself with, there was, I mean, it's just better for him that he had never endured any of it. It's a Not a, life. I think you're absolutely right about that, but I'll add something. If he'd never been born, he wouldn't be remembered forever in the, as the vile villain that we remember him to have been. You see, remember what we talked about earlier about how important honor and shame are to biblical peoples. Judas, had he never been born, nobody, Judas wouldn't have been the swear word that it is now. Or they, yeah. you know, how often do you hear people say, oh, there's that Judas. Yeah. So literally Judas's name has become a byword. And contempt. That's right. Ever exactly. So yeah, that that's why it would be better for Ju Judas never who, to have been born. It's because he wouldn't re be remembered the way that he is. Yeah. Yep. Everlasting contempt on Judas. When I, yep. Still today. I don't think that'll ever go away. I so. agree with you. I think that even into eternity, our bliss will not be interrupted by the um, by the fact that we know mm -hmm. that it was vile what these people did, and they got what they deserved. Yep. But I will say this because this came up. I think this might I might have seen a hint of this in the chat. Um, as terrible as I think the fate of annihilation is, as fearful as it, of it as I am, I still think it makes a lot more sense how we believers could enjoy eternity if our unbelieving loved ones have been executed finally than if they are kept alive and immortal forever in misery. And here's how why. How does the wound heal? Well, exactly. See, we, I have lost two children myself, oh, oh. and and I still continue periodically to feel the pain of that. But over time, it's gotten less and less frequent that I experience that pain. And in time, I think I can say I've fully moved on. You see, we're able to move on. Even after a long period of grieving, we're able to move on when our loved ones pass away. But imagine that you're on a cruise trying to enjoy a, 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 celebra a celebration on a cruise, and you find out that a loved one of yours has been imprisoned in Saudi Arabia or something like that and is being tortured. Are you going to be able to enjoy your cruise, knowing that your loved one is being so brutally violated on some other part, part of the globe? No. Even if you think he's getting what he deserves, you're still not going to be able to enjoy what you're experiencing. So that's another reason. I mean, again, like you said, we're not talking about philosophical things here, but since these kinds of questions are coming up in the chat, yeah, these are additional reasons to consider what we're saying. Uh, Alan, yes, forever and ever, day and night, existing forever. Okay, Alan, I'm sorry, honey. I, I don't think you're understanding us when, or maybe you are, and just uh, I don't know. It's he's either we're going to to disagree on that. Yeah, Alan either didn't listen, um, didn't understand, or just doesn't care that we already answered that issue. So you know, and, and that's fine. That's his his prerogative, right? We're not here to condemn him or anybody else for not agreeing with us. Right, right. So, um, yeah, it's again. If if you disagree with this position, it's fine. I'm I'm not saying you have to believe. I'm nobody's trying to make you believe it. It's just a defense of what I personally believe, and I I think Chris does a great informed presentation of this position. So, um, 
oh, I just lost the place there. Is oh, okay. I thought that was a question for you, but it was just him yelling a point. I think. <laughs> is one sense just for separating man from God? Yes, of course it's just. But nobody's coming against the God's justice. Okay, let's see. 78 lit it says, Do you I like your name? Do you believe in torment until the final judgment when everything is cast into the lake of fire? I, I will let Chris answer his position and I'll answer mine. Did you hear that? Yeah, so as I've already explained, I'm one of those bizarre minority of Christians that don't think human beings are conscious between death and resurrection. So I don't think that there's torment going on in Hades while resurrection or until resurrection. Um, if I were, uh, if I held to the traditional view of human persons that we have immaterial souls, then yes, I would say those are the the, the souls of the wicked are tormented in Hades until the resurrection. After resurrection, yes, I think there's torment involved, just in the same way that there's torment involved when a person is being killed on the electric chair, or being burned at the stake, or being stoned to death, or being shot at the firing squad, or even being crucified, right? Or fire from heaven, right? The death penalty typically inflicts a great deal of pain, sometimes experienced longer than others. I don't know how long that pain will be experienced, how long it will take for God to kill the finally wicked, but yes, I think it will be painful. I just think that the punishment being inflicted isn't the pain. The punishment being inflicted is not having life anymore. That's the punishment inflicted by all those forms of capital punishment that I just mentioned, but the, all those forms of capital punishment I just mentioned are experienced very differently. And there could be a great deal of torment while you're being killed. That's my particular view. I hope that answers the question. Yeah. And also when, you know, Jesus says, you know, your day, your torment will be, or your punishment will be worse on the day of judgment. Yeah. Just because we, I don't believe their, their torment goes for all of eternity. Doesn't mean that I don't believe it, that, that it's, that there's any pain involved. Right. I'm not saying they don't suffer. Yeah. And see, I wonder if the reason why some people have that impression is because of the word annihilation. Um, I don't know how many of the people in chat or, or even you, Renee, have seen the the Avengers movies, including the last movies. Um, and in the at the end of the second to last Avengers movie, this villain named Thanos snaps his finger and half of the universe's population literally disappear. They just, they fall apart into the dust and blow away. And I think that maybe when people hear annihilation, that's what they're thinking of, sort of a finger snap and boom, the wicked are gone. No, we're talking about a violent, painful execution, the likes of which Christ suffered on the cross, the likes of which Sodom and Gomorrah suffered by fire from heaven, and on and on it goes. The people who drowned in the flood, and on and on it goes. Yeah, I mean, they literally are risen into a body and thrown alive into fire and brimstone like lava like fire like i mean that's going to be horrible not to mention the 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 fear they're going to feel and the regret of knowing if they'd have just received christ that he offered yeah. it freely by his grace and they rejected it after what he suffered all of that but i you had made a good point I have often thought if I think somebody I love is ongoing suffering, how am I, are they going to have to wipe the memory of them out of my mind forever? Because thinking that they are somewhere like that. Yeah. You know, I don't think about eternal conscious torment much anymore because I don't think that's what the Bible teaches any longer. But, you know, now that I think about it, that, yeah, that's another reason. It'd be very difficult for me. It's like things just make more sense for me now. Right. And, and and consider consider this. Sometimes the answer that defenders of eternal torment will give to what you just mentioned, this idea that the our lost loved ones in hell, suffering in hell, is going to make it difficult for us to enjoy eternity. The answer that defenders will uh, of eternal torment will often give is that when we see, when we are made like God in our glorification following resurrection, um we will see things from his perspective and see how just and appropriate their punishment is. And you know what? I think that's absolutely sensible. That makes perfect sense. But here's the problem with that. God himself does not take pleasure. That's right. 
in meeting out punishment. And he That's explicitly right. says so in the Old Testament. He says, I take no pleasure in the deaths of the wicked. Yeah. So if we're going to be made like God, and if we will recognize how just it is that people are suffering in hell, we're not going to take pleasure in their experiencing it. And if they are continuing to experience it for all eternity, I don't know how we could continue to, or how we could have uninterrupted uh, bliss in eternity. And God loves more, not less. That's right. So that's right. Yeah, that would that's a difficult one. Um, Jack Smack, uh, hi buddy. I don't I don't know if you saw earlier uh, when we were talking about the symbolism in Revelation, because he asked, so the beast and the false prophet were annihilated because it says you know the burn forever and ever that symbolism is um explained the vision represents something and uh uh it's explained earlier in the video uh, well and I'd, and I'd like since it was brought up to add one more reason for understanding revelation 20 in the way that i defended earlier and that is precisely the fact that the beast is what is tormented forever and never in a lake of fire. I, and I think this is the case with you as well, Renee, uh, am an inerrantist. I don't think that the Bible contains any contradictions because I think it's inspired by God from start to finish. Now, with that in mind, consider that the vision that Daniel sees in Daniel 7 um, is extremely similar to the vision of uh, that's recorded in the book of Revelation. And it's very clear that they are foretelling many of the same events. Um, and we could talk about why that's very clear. But here's the real point that I want to get at. Daniel, he sees the beast experience a fate in fire too. He sees that the beast is thrown that is slain and then thrown a uh, thrown dead into a river of fire. John, he sees the beast thrown alive into a lake of fire and they're tormented forever and ever. Now, if we're going to treat both of those things literalistically, then we have a contradiction in scripture. And why be a Christian anymore at that point? But because we know that these are symbolic representations in Daniel's and John's visions, respectively, we can say as long as the interpretation of these different pictures is the same, then we can uphold the inherency, we can affirm the inerrancy of Scripture. With that in mind, consider how the angel interprets the vision for Daniel. This is in Daniel 7, and I'll start in verse 19 from the King James. Daniel says to the angel, Then I would know the truth of the fourth beast, which was diverse from all the others, exceedingly dreadful, etc., etc., etc. And if you fast forward a little bit more, the angel tells him what it means. This is in verse 23. Thus, he, that is the angel, said to me, Daniel, The fourth beast shall be a fourth kingdom upon earth. Notice again, the beast is a symbol for something, a symbol for a kingdom. And look what he goes on to say um, in verse 26, the judgment shall sit and they shall take away his dominion to consume and destroy it unto the end. And in fact, some translations, instead of destroy, use the word annihilate. So you see, so you see, the picture here is that the beasts being killed and thrown dead into the stream of fire in Daniel's vision is interpreted by the angel as symbolizing the annihilation of a kingdom's dominion, an institution's persecutive power. So when Dan John sees the beast thrown alive into a lake of fire and tormented forever and ever, wouldn't the Annihilation of an institution's power be consistent with what we've already said, the annihilation of death, the annihilation of wicked, etc. Obviously, it would be consistent. So here's yet another reason for understanding Revelation 20 in this way. Ah, that's funny, Ben. <laughs> he said, here's two burning questions. <laughs> <laughs> burning questions. Love it. Anytime, anytime we get into a discussion on hell, you get the hell puns. It's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> You're punny, Ben. <laughs> okay. Uh, oh, let me answer. The viewer asked me about the torment. Uh, uh, Chris answered, I, I have a little bit different view. I do believe uh, when we're absent from the body, we're immediately present with the Lord. I believe those under the altar are waiting for their bodies and God brings those people back with them and they're given a glorified body and they live eternally in their when they put on mortality you have to have a physical body to be like jesus here on the earth to live on the earth so 
uh, I do believe when we leave this body, we are conscious wherever we go. Uh, I do not believe the dead know what's going on here. They don't know what's going on under what's happening on the earth. They don't know anything under the sun. So uh, I think the dead are never referring to uh, the saved. The dead are uh, the lost. And those people, there's not a lot of information on it. There's some things implied. And if you want to take the story of Lazarus and the rich man, which is about uh, uh, Hades or the place where the dead are uh, as uh, literal, then yeah, probably, maybe. I mean, if they're, but see, I don't know because the scriptures aren't real, real clear about the intermediate state of the dead. They just tell us about what they're risen again to. They're risen again to condemnation, to destruction, to uh, everlasting punishment. So they're uh, brought back into, into, they're risen, and then they're destroyed. Uh, so as far as a, an intermediate state, I'm not sure about that. I wouldn't be willing to say, oh, yes, absolutely. Scripture is clear that the minute you die, uh, if you're lost, you go to an intermediate in between place called Hades. And in Hades, there is a, a, a torment until you're risen again and thrown into the lake of fire. I can't I can't know for certain uh, but I have no problem with it. The uh, people have confronted me about it, though, Chris, because they say, well, what if somebody died 3,000 years ago? They're in Hades for 3,000 and they're going right. longer. And how is that? How is that just? And again, I don't have answers to God's justice, what he thinks is just and what isn't. I don't know. And it's not clear to me. Well, but I believe the saved immediately go to be with the Lord. I do. Sure. And, and and it's a very respectable position. The vast majority of Christians hold to it, and I don't denigrate anybody who does. I do want to at least hazard a guess as to what might answer that question, though, because I think there is a there is a bit of intuitive bite to that challenge that, look, you've got, say, Pharaoh, the Pharaoh that uh, Joseph interpreted the dreams of, he has been in Hades uh, potentially, you know, for uh, what, uh, uh, 4,500 years roughly, um, experiencing torment. Presumably he wasn't saved. So what, at some point in the future, he's going to rise and face a violent execution and, and that's it. Um, and there does there is a bit of intuitive bite there, but here's what I would propose. Firstly, we don't know what time is experienced like in Hades. Um, all we experience time as is as embodied human beings. Um, and, and the reason we know that is because we measure time through things like the changing of our appearance, the increase in our height, the increased width of our guts in my case, and so on and so forth. So, so we experience time as embodied creatures. What it would be like to experience time as a disembodied soul in Hades simply isn't described anywhere. So it's entirely feasible that what is to us who are still alive for 4,500 years in Hades could be experienced by the person in Hades as fairly brief. We just don't know. Um, the second thing I'll add is that um, if we do, uh, let me put it this way. One of the most frequently offered arguments for a conscious intermediate state by Christians is that you couldn't have a genuine resurrection if you don't have a, con a continuous consciousness from the moment you die until the moment you're raised. If, if you cease to exist when you die, then the resurrected you wouldn't really be the resurrected you, it would be a recreated clone. So the arg that's the way the argument goes. I'm not saying I endorse that, but that's, but right. But, but so the way that a lot of Christians will press this argument is to say that means that you've got to have human immaterial souls continuing to exist between death and resurrection so that you can say the resurrected person is the person who died. Now consider this, the death, the first death of both the saved and the lost is, has, is going to be followed by resurrection. And if that argument that I just reproduced uh, on the part of most Christians is, is a good argument, then the reason anybody exists consciously between death and resurrection is so that they can one day be raised. 
Mm-hmm. But, but when they're killed a second time and they're never going to be raised again, you don't need to um, preserve their disembodied soul in a subhuman half existence. Mm-hmm. And what's more, if all of this, what I've just offered as a possibility, it's not what I believe, but if all of that that I offered as a possibility is in fact true, where else would the lost go when they die? They're, they're lost. They're not saved. What do you expect them to be in the blissful, you know, um, pain-free enjoyment of God's presence in, hate, in, in the intermediate state? Of course not. You would expect them to go to something akin to the place where death row criminals go while waiting to be killed, mm-hmm. which would be like a prison sentence. And I think it makes sense to think of Sheol or Hades as like a prison cell where the lost are awaiting their final execution. That makes sense to me. But to say I'm certain, I cannot. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, I'm not certain either. Yeah, I cannot. But I, I am, I'm pretty, I'm secure, I'm very secure in my position on the destruction of the wicked. Uh, but I would not say I'm absolutely certain about uh, the lost intermediate state. Um All right, here's one of the burning questions. Don't you think it's entirely possible that Haiti, Sheol, Gehenna, Tartarus are synonyms that mean the exact same thing, which is why the King James transliters just use the word hell instead? I'm going to let Chris answer, but I would have a quick answer. No, because Jesus did go to Hades, but he did not go to hell. He did not go to Gehenna. And, and that's an excellent answer. Um, I am not a King James onlyist. Uh, I'm not even a King James firstist like you are, Renee, and that's okay. I'm not at all denigrating that. Um, but yeah, I think the translators of the King James version did think that all these things were references to the same place and therefore translated them all accordingly. And I think they did so mistakenly. And the reason I think they did so mistakenly is because the Bible makes it clear that that approach was mistaken. Um, As I've already mentioned, Peter, quoting the psalm, says Jesus went to Hades. But if but Jesus going to hell is heresy. That's a heretical belief. Um, There's also the fact, as I already said, that Luke 16 itself makes it clear that this isn't taking place in hell, the place of final punishment, because the rich man's brothers are still alive, blissfully unaware of their impending doom. It must be the intermediate state. And the fact that the translators of the King James Version didn't get that, I think should cause us to question the perfectness of the King James Version. And of course, I do question its perfectness. Um, but if somebody wants to think that it is perfect and the those are in fact all synonyms and the King James Version translators were right to translate them that way, then they're the ones who are going to have to somehow explain how Jesus went to hell. They're the ones who are going to have to explain how in hell there are still people who don't know they're outside of hell. I mean, it just, it, you run into all sorts of problems that you can't explain. Oh, um, there's people teaching that nasty heresy. I hear it. Yeah. Even yeah. in some Baptist churches, I've heard it. Oh, it's horrible stuff. Yep. Yeah, uh, I thank you. Yeah, you actually. Oh, I, well, I, sorry, let me say one more thing because I didn't answer what I think was a part of Glad Tidings' question, and he's just repeated it, which is, don't you think it's possible that the Greek and Hebrew authors knew these words to be synonyms? No, it's simply not possible. Um, That's absolutely clear because it's the biblical authors who were very careful to use Hades and Sheol and Tartarus to refer to things that in context have to do with intermediate state type things. And those same authors and Jesus himself are the ones who used Gehenna and the phrase Lake of Fire to refer to something which is about the final fate of the wicked. So the biblical authors, authors themselves are using these two families of words to refer to two different um, time periods, two different states of being, or two different punishments, whatever. Um, So the fact that the King James Version translators got it wrong, too bad for them. I care what the biblical authors wrote, not what the King James Version translators translated. Uh, and, I, and I just want to say I'm sorry if I'm offending people that have the, who have a who hold the King James in high esteem. I'm not trying to denigrate that. I'm just saying this is my personal conviction, and I think that the biblical evidence in any translation is clear that these aren't in fact synonyms. Okay, this is a pretty much the same kind of question, but they're like, how come it says that I think it says that Satan is thrown in the lake of fire where the beast of false prophet are after a thousand years. 
Because as I already said, the vision that John sees depicts everlasting torment. You see, um, th this is hard. We American, um, and or, or I should just say Western uh, 21st century people, we don't get the idea of symbolic visions very well because it's not something we're steeped in. But the one, but there is one uh, example of it that I saw recently that that some of your listeners might remember, some of your viewers might remember. In the Superman movie called Man of Steel from roughly 10 years ago, five years ago, something like that, there's a scene in which Superman is, and, and just to be clear, I'm not at all trying to say we should get our biblical interpretation from Superman movies. I'm just, I'm just using this as an analogy, as an illustration, so bear with me, folks. In that movie, Superman is asleep. And unbeknownst to him, he is being shown a vision by General Zod. And um, in the vision, at one point, Superman finds that he is standing upon a um, thick layer of human skulls stretching as far as the eye can see. Now, in the movie, what becomes clear is that this vision that General Zod is inducing in the sleeping Superman's mind, this vision is meant to communicate that General Zod and his minions will kill all humankind. You know what he was not trying to tell Superman that he could expect? To one day be standing on a sea of skulls. This is the, the, the picture of standing on an endless sight of scrolls stretching off into every direction to the horizon is a symbol representing the annihilation of all humankind in the movie. Nobody watching that thinks that the future is going to entail a sea of human skulls upon which Superman is standing. So, so it, so when it does show up to us in art, we still get it that you can, you can symbolize something that isn't identical to the thing it represents. And that's what I'm saying is happening in the book of revelation. Um, the seven headed, 10 horned beast is not the future. It's a symbolic representation of the future. It being tormented forever and ever and ever and ever in a lake of fire is what John sees, but that's not what it means any more than the beast means a seven-headed hen toward beast in reality. <laughs> so this fate of being of, of torment in forever and ever in the lake of fire is a symbol for a final punishment that is consistent with annihilation, as we have already demonstrated throughout this conversation. Okay, so uh, this question is, if death is the last enemy to be destroyed, how can anything slash anyone after that be destroyed? Those whose names are not written in the book of life are cast in after death. Right. So this is a problem with, once again, trying to press the imagery of Revelation into too much literalism. This the, You're talking about two things being thrown into the lake of fire within the proximity of like a half a verse. It's, it's extremely close to each other. Um, and we're not told how long after it's thrown into the lake of fire, its torment is supposed to represent the annihilation of death or anything like that. In other words, what we see as a scene in which a bunch of things are thrown into a lake of fire where they presumably share the, this everlasting torment of the uh, that is the fate of the devil, the beast, and the false prophet in the imagery. So a bunch of stuff is thrown in. What the exact sequence of those things are, the, dev the devil, or sorry, death and Hades and the resurrected wicked, that's not something the imagery is intending to communicate. But you know what is trying to communicate sequence of events is 1 Corinthians 15. The, the whole it's talking about how there's a sequence he literally says there's an order to the resurrection first christ then those who are his at his, at his coming and then the end will come and the last enemy to be destroyed is death so the author paul of first corinthians 15 is intentionally focusing on sequence of events and he says the last such event the last enemy to be destroyed is death so after so here's what I think is the, the the closest we can come to as far as detailed sequence of events on the last day. There will be a resurrection of the wicked. And, and as an amillennialist, I think this is when the righteous will be resurrected as well. The wicked will be judged and they will be sentenced to death and um, they will die and God's people will have been made immortal. So now that God's people have been made immortal, uh, nobody will ever die again. So death has been destroyed. But there aren't any enemies, there aren't any enemies of God remaining to be destroyed because it was the last one. 
So we can make sense of 1 Corinthians 15 in annihilationism, but it cannot be made sense of with eternal torment because in eternal torment, again, you have enemies that continue to exist and rebel for eternity long after death has been destroyed. Okay, I'm scrolling back through because um, Glad Tidings said he posted two questions and I'm trying to find the second one. While you're doing that, I'll just say that if we could try to wrap this up in like 10 yeah, minutes or so, yeah. that would be good for me. My son's got school. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's it's a, 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 as, as dark and as dire as the topic is, it's nevertheless something we could talk about for hours very easily. Yeah. 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 I think this is the last one I'm trying to see where it was. Uh, Glad Tidings, were you able to repost it? He did. Yes, I see it right now. See it. If Tartarus is a place for, quote, fallen angels... Why does Matthew 25, 41 say that unbelievers go to the same place prepared for the devils and angels? Uh, that That's not Tartarus. They're right. all intermediate. Go ahead. I'm sorry. No, 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 no. It's, it's good. Um, the reason, the answer to this question is actually very straightforward. It's because when Peter talks about Tartarao, the verb meaning to cast into Tartarus, he's talking about the intermediate state, not their final state. So if you look at 2 Peter 2 4, look what it says. It, it, it's, it's asking a rhetorical question, or, I, or rather I should say, he ends up finishing his question several verses later. But his question begins with God, God did not spare angels when they sinned, past tense. But Tartarao'd them, he cast them, past tense, into Tartarus, and committed them to chains of gloomy darkness to be kept until the judgment. You see, in Peter, Tartarus is not the final fate of the angels, it's their temporary fate, their intermediate fate. And they're being held there, according to Peter, until the final judgment. Well, doesn't that align very nicely with the idea that humans go to a intermediate state of punishment until they until their final judgment? And if the final judgment of both parties is in fact annihilation, which we've seen is already the case from Matthew 25 and other texts, then it makes perfect sense that the fate of these two groups, angels and humans, would be described uh, alongside one another because it's the same fate. But anyway, the point of all this is just to say that when Peter talks about Tartarus, he is talking about the intermediate state of angels. And we know that because he says that that's where they will be chained until the day of judgment. Yeah. So what I, I would say the same thing. I always uh, saw Tartarus as a specific prison for the fallen angels and Hades as the place where the dead went until the day of judgment until right. the resurrection where the lost are risen to everlasting contempt, uh, everlasting punishment, everlasting destruction. Uh, and, and technically the prepared for the devil and his angels is talking about the lake of fire. That's for right. Exactly. The devil and his angels. It's talking about what Jesus uses as the word Gehenna, the lake That's of right. fire. So yep. they're going to the same place ultimately. Although humans are not in Tartarus, their ultimate destination is the same place, the Lake of Fire. Yep. So, yeah, uh, they, there was a lot of discussion on King James. Uh, I do find some things that are off. It was my, uh, it, it's, it is my go-to version because I've read it for so many years. That's what I'm familiar with. And I do trust that what's written as far as doctrine and stuff, it, the, that it's good. I, I understand it very well. However, I saw things like the word Lucifer being stuck in there, some Latin word that didn't belong. There's a couple of things in there that I think confuse. And this is one of the major issues. The fact that all these words are translated the same word is I have to sit down and explain to people which words being used and stuff. And not that there's error in the King James. It's just, it makes it harder to understand. So I am a King James first, but I also read Geneva and I look at other versions like Young's literal sometimes too. So um, I wanted to thank everybody for coming out. Uh, I, I'm glad there was no name calling. Well, not much of it. <laughs> uh, and I hope that we can, uh, learn to hear each other out 
and to at least respect one another on these things and try to do all things with love. Paul says, if you don't have love, you're nothing but clanging symbols. Uh, it doesn't matter what you're saying, no matter how profound, it's nothing but noise if you don't do it with love. So I think it's very important that we follow these things. And I want to thank you, Chris, for taking uh, time away from your family and hanging out and answering our questions and answering the viewer questions. I really enjoyed our conversation and I hope that you'll come back and visit with us again. Yeah, I'm happily happy to come on again. And as I said, I'm, it was an honor. And um, uh, I meant what I said earlier, again, not trying to inflate your ego or anything, but you are you are very astute and well spoken. And it was a it was a real pleasure um, to be grilled by you and by your audience. Thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. Thank you. And just so you guys know, again, he has a website and a YouTube channel called Rethinking Hell. We have both links in the description box as well as I believe on the screen. Thank you, Ben, for producing this and doing all the graphics and all the behind the scene work. We would not be able to do this without you and I'm so grateful for it. Thank you guys so much and God bless you in the name of our great savior, Jesus Christ. Good night. Good night.